dream of flying. from your present. It's time. Time for change. Change your imagination into reality. Be brave to unleash your power to encounter fears. Be brave to change yourself from a follower to a leader. A leader who leads progress to society. Of course, it's not easy. Of course, it will discourage you. Of course, difficulties await you. Don't be frightened. Call up your courage, let it out, and go further with your new creation. <clears throat> Believe in yourself. Believe in calling voices. Believe in your determination. Build it up. Break the cycle of repetition. Don't be frightened to be different. Design it. Show your identity to start a new trend for this world. Draw your lines to create things the world has never seen. Welcome to the future of dreams. Go out to give happiness and fun as a giver. Say hello to all unified differences. Be pleased to learn new things. Things which are filled by courage. Things which are filled by challenge. Call them out. The voices of happiness. The voices of determination. Will you wait for the world to change? Or you yourself 
use your power to change this world, to make a better world for everyone. Because the day has come, the day a great dream is changed into a goal. The day you could see a brighter future than ever. is considered to be the very heart of Thailand. But agricultural academic study is not as equally popular, both in the secondary schools and universities. If we provide a new perspective that is a true agricultural innovation, Thailand's strength would surely be restored. Because there are four main strengths of Thailand. They are first in the medical field, the foundation of Thai culture makes people love being service-minded. Second, regarding tourism, Thailand's beautiful landscapes make it popular among tourists. Third is talent in creative art, creative thinking, and designing. And fourth, with agriculture, we can expect that the produce of Thai farmers will reach the world kitchen. Opening up the College of Agricultural Innovation, Food and Biotechnology is Dr. Atit Urairat's way of thinking outside the box and giving back to the country. Thailand's main backbone is agriculture, giving back to the homeland in order to optimize the quality of life of farmers. Developing the country and its important economic backbone can be done through food production and agriculture. This is considered essential because out of the gross domestic product of the country, the agricultural base economy is the most important. This agricultural foundation defines the future of the nation as a result of food security. Education is also considered most important in driving the development of the country. The Rangsit University president has pondered how the university can best respond to questions of socio-economic development for Thailand. This is why the university has decided to establish the three faculties simultaneously. There are the Agricultural Innovation Faculty, Biotechnology Faculty, and the Food Technology Faculty. Together, they make up the College of Agricultural Innovation, Food and Biotechnology. The first faculty is the Biotechnology faculty, which focuses on technological development. The only difference from others is that for Thailand's future, we will have our own form of biotechnology. The second faculty is Agricultural Innovation. Instead of learning basic agriculture, we want to give students knowledge to be able to evaluate biotechnology and combine it with other forms of technology in order to develop agricultural genius, as hoped by the rector. That's why we have brought in various technologies to be combined in order to compete with foreign countries. The third is the Food Technology Faculty. We will use biotechnology, among other technologies, to create fresh new food products with value. I'm 
confident that the graduating students from the College of Agricultural Innovation, Food and Biotechnology of Rexit University will go out and clearly fulfill the demands and requirements of the commercial agricultural sector. Food processing is also considered important. We will focus on creating food products that can be samples and prototypes for the agribusiness industry. We will soon see products from RSU or Rangsit University soon. There are many commercial crops in Thailand, but the country's agricultural methods still rely on the soil and the weather. Our courses will help farmers overcome these restrictions. Farmers would then learn how to prepare for the uncertain changes in the weather that would solve weather problems and the inability to sell produce. We will help plan out what to plant and what could be sold. The biotechnology curriculum will focus on applied technology in order to create innovations. It concentrates on plant technologies to support Thailand's primary industries. Apart from this, we also have renewable energy technology, which is an important technology that will increase competitiveness in the global market and the study of ethanol and biodiesel production. In addition, the course also focuses on supporting activities, including a short-term training program. Students will get the chance to train at the university or at related companies abroad to help them broaden their knowledge. The Faculty of Food Technology is like the last jigsaw puzzle piece, completing the agriculture industry. Agricultural innovation is able to develop the country's main occupation, agriculture, to become more effective on par with other developed countries. This is why opening up the three correlating faculties will help support and reinforce each other in the development of the food production chain and thus promote Thailand to step up to be a leading manufacturer and food exporter of the world. The College of Agricultural Innovation, Food and Biotechnology can be considered the last puzzle piece of Rangsit University that will develop all four strengths of the country with pride. Thank you all for watching our college and university presentation. I think it's a good time for our conference. At this, at this time, I would like to invite our lecturer of college of Agricultural Innovation, Biotechnology, and Food of Lancet University to deliver the opening remarks. Please join me in welcoming Professor Dr. Prongsek Angkasit. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Distinguished guest, keynote speaker, participant, student, Staff, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of a College of Agricultural Innovation, Biotechnology and Food, it is a, an honor and pleasure for me to welcome you all to this special conference on the topic of agricultural innovation for sustainable future. First, I would like to give my appreciation and sincere gratitude to our distinguished speaker who are coming today to give us their opinions, their knowledge concerning on their uh, interest and their research, which they have been done for many times. And with this expertise, it will make us to learn and uh, understand more in the future of sustainable agriculture, which is it includes the professor from two from Japan and one from Korea. The first speaker today will be Professor Dr. Tof Tofeo Ahmed from University of Tsukuba, Japan, who will give us his talk on automation or precision economics for sustainable agricultural system. And secondly, we we'll go to Professor Dr. Su Yunchu Yu, University of Anang, Korea. He will give us the 
topics of uh, genetics factors involved in regional adaptation of an abiotic stress tolerance in rice. And we will finish by the third speaker who came from uh, Niigata University from Japan, Professor Dr. Shinrimasu Toru. He will give us the talk on the new beauty process of Japanese rice wine, sake, with the sterilization on high, high hydraulic pressure. So with these this, uh, three speakers today, I hope that we will be uh, benefit, will be a uh, topic that we will learn from uh, each of them who are expert in specific topics. So I hope that this uh, conference will be fruitful and will give us uh, more view and more opinion on this development. This is what we thought that is in our uh, most important for the development of agriculture in Thailand, especially the, in the development of agricultural innovation, biotechnology, and food technology. Last but not least for this conference, I hope that uh, during our conference, I hope that our participants, our students, will give more uh, talk, uh, discussion on what the topic that you more uh, interest and write to do more deeply and then they will give you more detail and discussion. I would like to take uh, the oppor this opportunity for uh, our conference out from our college that's uh, for the three of our speakers who are uh, very kind to come to Thailand and give us the talk today. So I hope that this time will be the good time to, for us to receiving the opinion and experience on specific top, topics. And I'd like to give, us, uh, give uh, our sincere gratitude and thanks to uh, these three uh, speakers from Japan and from Korea. And thanks for our participants who come and join us today. And special thanks for the Research and Development Institute of Rangsit University who give us the opportunity and support our conference today. Finally, I wish you all uh, the good time to enjoy our conference today. So. Uh, again, I'd like to give my thanks uh, to our uh, speaker today. I hope that uh, we'll be enjoy and uh, fruitful our conference today. So I'd like to declare open this conference. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor, for the wonderful remarks. Moving right along, um, this is now my pleasure to introduce our first guest speaker. His um, associate professor, Dr. Torfel Ames. His background education in doctoral degree is agricultural robotic and automation from University of Tsukuba in Japan. Then, um, then in 2010, he has been working with University of Tsukuba in Faculty of Life and Environmental Science. I could say he is an expert in automation and robotics in agriculture. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Associate Professor Dr. Torfael Ahmed. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, the rector, Professor, Professor Pong Sak, from, originally is from Chiang Mai University, and, and uh, Professor Banyat. So it's my privilege to talk about uh, automation, precision agronomics. Actually, what we are working last 10 to 15 years 
now uh, the automation has come to a point. I just uh, saw the video, what you have done, the echophonics is really amazing. So today my presentation will cover uh, several points of automation, what we are doing, and what the other worlds are concerning about the automations. So I call this a precision agronomics. Precision agronomics means how precise we control the inputs for seed, fertilizers, and the pesticides. Okay, so uh, let me cover a few points of mechanizations. Uh, last 50 years back, the mechanization increased the productivity twice against the food and hunger. Now, what the need for mechanization to optimize the inputs, so how much we need to utilize the seeds, fertilizers, and the waters. So water is one of the precise, precise things we need to face over. So today's presentation, I cover mainly the three mechanizations points. One is the outdoor mechanization. How, what are the things for outdoors? What are the control or indoor mechanizations or automations? And the third section, I'll cover software advancement. What are the software is also important for mechanizations. So in three sections, I'll talk with the precision ag, guidance, uh, system automation, and then sensing systems. So first part, let's go ahead with outdoor mechanization. What are the going on the outdoor mechanization? So this is what we call the labels of automations and mechanizations. So recently I'm working with one United States company about like autonomous, like a robot system. So we call level zero, level one, level two, level three, level four, and level five. So the automation, like in Thailand, most likely what I was doing with my PhD students from uh, Kassesat and others. So level zero and level one, most likely. But in Japan, we have still like a, uh, like GPS guidance systems or things. We call it still level one, level two. Like assisted autonomies are there. So the automations are going really fast. So in the United States, like a case and others, they move to level three, like a partial autonomy, full autonomy. So in assisted autonomy, this uh, driverless. So we are trying to move out the driver. But it's a question of safety and many points. So level two and level three, where Japan stands for, so we call is a partial automation or assisted autonomy for uh, levels of automations. Uh, this is the precision agriculture cycle, as you know, that we have uh, numbers of execution points, starting from the weedings, GPS, data transfer, data storage. So numbers of points we can use. Okay. Oh, maybe no problem. Oh, it's okay. So, okay, yeah. So we, you can see that the precision cycles are move over in a different segments. So 50 years back, we just wanted to pulverize the soil in the machines. Now, after 50 years later, we try to make more information together. So mechanization and information. So we try to control the inputs. So where's the seed needs? Where's the fertilizer needs? What amount of minimum water is needed? So now agriculture become more precise. It's not like anymore like a rough. So we are trying to make our bioresources. After many years later, we understand that this bioresource is very important for us. So now we are taking it. When I started working in Precision Egg in 2000, it was not much popular. After 10 in 18 years later, when the climate change come out and the precision issues came out again in the front, because people had an issue of like how to survive our bioresources. So the precision ag is one of the point where we can do that one. So it has a number of stages, harvesting, yield monitoring, soil sampling, data analysis, crop scouting. So numbers of driving forces are involved in the mechanization part. So the planning sessions, growing seasons, and harvesting seasons, where we need the, the precisions and the automations. So just uh, let me focus on outdoor mechanization, automation, precision in agriculture inputs, especially for seed, fertilizers, how we control and the waters. Uh, 
So we have numbers of things for agricultural tillage, sowing, field operation, road navigations. Numbers of points are involved in each of the each of the phases. So let me focus on the land preparation. Why the automation is very important. Why? Because this automation can increase the productivity 1.75. So now we have the productivity 1.4 times, we call TFP, total factor productivity. But if we can bring out the, the agronomics, information, and automation together, we can increase our productivity 1.75 times. So there's the part of the uh, things for the land preparation, which is more important. You can see this is a, in Sukuba, close to our field. Uh, the way we do the agriculture is like a puddling, you call it, in whole water. You can imagine if there is no rain, we cannot transplant anymore. So it's very important to change the idea because most of the Japanese field, we do the transplanting after the puddling when there is standing water. So if there is no rain, what would happen? So can we do the agriculture that way? So most of the Asian agricultures are irrigated agriculture. Now we need to think how we can change our the practices because rain doesn't come. So because you are from Thailand, the monsoon is the issue. When the monsoon comes, but if the monsoon change, there will be no rain. So we cannot transplant the rice. So that's the, one of the big issues for us. You look about this is the United States. I used to work in the University of Illinois. So the land are very dry, very dry. So their land, Asian land and the American land are quite different. So the agricultures are quite different. That's why agronomy is very local. Thailand agronomy and then agronomy in uh, Japan and the United States and Europe are very different. The machine size are different. This is uh, my PhD student who was working on the swamp areas in Thailand. You can see how difficult to make the paddling so he worked on like a six, seven years on to make like a secondary tillage implements under the Minister of Agriculture. It's not quite easy to make the automation. The robots is very difficult. So agricultures are very diverse, very different. So we need to look about many points for agricultural issues. So the field robots in Japan, this is for land preparation, you can see. So I saw showed you several land preparation traditional. Now in Japan, due to the labor shortages, uh, we are trying to move much more like automations. So very difficult, surely, because recently, Yanmar and Kubota, they bring out the prototypes. But this is still a partial autonomy, we call partial autonomy, because the safety points is regulations and how to utilize the peoples for the, the machines. You can see these are the field robots in Hokkaido University. So they are like a multiple robots, but it's still in the experimental level. So automation in Japan is moving more forward with the assisted autonomy. Assisted autonomy means there would be one tractor with the driver and the tractor would be without driver. So can control the other tractor for safety purposes. So this is the assisted autonomy is moving forward. Uh, let me show you some videos. I think the video file is not working, most likely. Anyway, no, no, it's not working. Maybe I changed the computer, so. It's anyway, this is one of the tilling robots I wanted to show you that uh, how it works over the time, the tilling based on the GPS. Now the GPS guidance are working with the, Japan has the new GPS systems, quasi zenith GPS, which is much more accuracy. So we had high accuracy systems of the GPS now. So it's a centimeter level of accuracy we can use the driverless tractors. This is in Tsukuba. Uh, there is a center we call Farm Robot Centers. I took the video. So how we can use for pulverize the soil using the robots. Uh, let me show that uh, transplantation, another part of the automation, especially for the rice transplanting. Most of the, in Asian country, we do transplanting rather than seedlings. You are agriculture, the broadcasting. So in the Japanese agriculture, it's one of the very tedious job to use the robots. 
So this is one of the robots, like autonomous transplanters, in uh, like a Japanese company now, Kubota and Yanmar is also working to bring out with the farmer's label as well. So the transplanters are mainly two types. One is a rice transplanter and it's the vegetable transplanters. So these are the common types of the transplanters. So if you see, this is the picture from United States, from Illinois. The field is very different compared to Asian field. You can see very dry. We can use a, like a uh, 50 feet, like a seed cam fertilizer distributors. Uh, it's a very dry, very dry. But we compare to our agriculture, but transplanting we do especially on the wetland. So the agriculture systems are very quite different. I'm not sure whether this video also works or not. Let's try. Yeah, I think it's working somehow. Look like there's some sounds coming out. No? Yeah, yeah, maybe it's... I think the computer is a little bit slow. Anyway, I, I just leave the PowerPoint. Maybe you can see the video later on how we use the, the robots for, um, the, for transplanters. It happens when you change the computer one to another, but sometimes source file doesn't work. Can you? <laughs> uh, the video is here. If the students live, they can use it for their own purpose. So each university has the different strength. So Sukuba University, we have been working. My friend, Professor Krinkra is also here. He was with me when I was doing my PhD. So we had a, uh, we focused on road navigation and multiple tasks. Each university has different strength. So it, it is uh, our university in Sukuba. We work on road navigation systems. So we use the different sort of sensors, uh, navigation planner, steering controller to move our like autonomous machines. So this is the, uh, the scenario still we are working. So usually Hokkaido University is working much more field level. So we are thinking not to that way. We are trying to make the how to attach the implements, how to road navigations, how to work the other things besides in like a farm. Because of course there's a firm is also needed, but as well as it is also needed to move out, to attach, couple the implements, and then uncouple the implements. So we have been working for uh, several years to make the, how we make the robot autonomously park inside the garage, and how to attach the implements with each others. For example, if uh, it moves, come out and go inside, and then it can approach to the implements as well. Because there are many injuries occurs when there is uh, a point to a coupling. Uh, I'm not sure whether it will work or not, but okay. These are my friend from uh, Payung Sak. He's now working in Suranar University. So he also work in the same robots. He was working on on using the trailer, and I was working on coupling the implements, how we couple the big implements and carry to the field, especially for, uh, for uh, fertilizers and also rotabatters. Let me see whether it, it also works. No, I think, yeah, this one is working somehow. So this video, at least you can see someone is working. <laughs> So this is somehow we are trying to utilize the robots to make uh, coupling the implement. So the others are working in the field because sometimes we need to couple the implement and take it to the field. So when we take to the field, we need to have a driverless systems which can couple and take it back. Because it needs a very high accuracy to, to couple a one implement using a laser range finder. So we do not use any GPS because inside we need to have much more precisions and coupling the implements. So this is what we call is automatic coupling. So for example, you have a large implements and there is a no driver. This implement is need to, to cultivate the soil. So something like this. So we, we worked on this sort of approaches rather on the field. Okay, so using the, uh, the laser range finders, we, we worked several years on that. 
Okay, this is some just uh, show you the way we move and come back uh, with a very high precision is needed to couple and one implement to each other's. So then uh, we have, because we have a very good relation with Thailand, I'm showing these videos to you because my students from Thailand, they did this job also. This is a point to go algorithms. Especially you have lots of like a rubber plantation and you have also well pump. How to carry those things? We were working a couple of years. So in many ways we try to use this sort of things in a different patterns of rubber field. If the labor shortages happens, how to carry, how to make the inside, and how to do that navigation. Uh, so you can see there are many ways we tried with our automated tractors. I hope this should work. Okay. Hope so. This is one of uh, my students from uh, Kasesat. Now he's a lecturer in uh, campus and campus. So we try to, this cone is actually resembles uh, what, a rubber plant. Because in Japan, there is no rubber plant, right? So we put the cone to make the rubber plant to inside. It should run inside the field and, and carry the huge numbers of like a rubber plants, also well pump. So based on uh, the numbers of like a carrying overs, because now we do not use any GPS, just we use accuracy with the rubber plant and things is very high. So it, we cannot receive the signals so we try to give more emphasis on inside automations, like a road, approaching, this sort of. So I'm really proud of uh, Dr. Mm. Pawin. He worked like a five years to develop these systems to, to make in a rubber plantations. Now he is working on sugar can now, bringing the same idea what we are working in five years in Japan. So you can see it's a uh, the turnover to carry out a huge numbers of bunches. Let me put out. There is some some points you can ask why. This is to stop to carry the goods. So when there are some special two trees, if we plant the rubber plantation by some from the very beginning, in some automated idea, we can easily make the automation systems. It's not difficult. Like a two trees together, other trees are separately. So it gives the idea. So for example, when it comes in two, it will come and stop. So when you make the rubber plantation, a well pump plantation, because it goes 25 years. So let's make the plantation in a system. We can make it for 25 years, we can make more automation. So just to save the time, this is just, we need to do it slowly because of safety. So it's an experimental. I just use the original speed to show you that how we can utilize this sort of things. So you can see when it two cones are there, it stops automatically. Then we moved on sensing and monitoring because not only the automation, we need to sense the crops, we need to sense the, the field. And uh, agriculture machines, in future, what we are thinking that agriculture machine become a data rich sensing. It's not only a robot tractor, it will sense the stuff. It will make the monitoring systems. So all agriculture machine become a data rich sensors. It will use like a AI, artificial intelligence and things. That's why uh, we also worked on sensing and monitoring over the years. So this is our systems. I also use a drone and things. This is a monitoring for a tower-based system for high quality data. Sometimes we need very high quality data for establish the calibration system. So this research I did in the United States and some of the research I did it in, like, in Japan as well. So this is like a field trials, if using like a small, small sensors, how we can utilize these things for, for collecting data for biomass, uh, crop growth and crop heights. So for example, if we use a simple like a uh, laser sensors, we can easily understand the, the height of the canopy, height of the thing. This is the surface height. Which, which places is higher and lower, we can easily understand this is the height. So if we just scan, we can easily understand height. And we can also calculate the total volume of the biomass. 
Uh, then this is a data rich, I told you that uh, in future, most of the machine would be data rich sensor machine. So we worked several years in Illinois to develop, like this is not sugar cane, this is called miscanthus. So it's close to sugar cane. So we thought in a how to make a big machine to sense the, like a sugar cane over, because this needs to three meter height. So then we developed a machine with numbers of sensors. You can see six sensors, then multispectral camera, lighters, to move over the like a three meter height crops, like sugar cane or miscanthus. So to make more quality data, we call data collection vehicles. So automation and precision is needed with a high quality data acquisitions. So this is the 3D data from the lighters, we call it the lighters. So you can easily understand the height. So once it is scanned, we can easily calculate the total volume of the biomass. So this is the advantage for uh, the data collection vehicles. So let's see this, uh, I hope it would run. So there are some, the, some data collection systems I'm showing you. So we, uh, I have been working. So small vehicles, this one is a, from tower, we collect the data for the corn for one season to make. So now we have a very nice, beautiful drones, right? Previously, I used to work with the large fly of the drones. So you can see over the time how it grows up. So for quality data, we need to, to monitor long time for like a, this sort of the robots we need as well to give the continuous data for the TARP. You know TARF, TARF. So we have the numbers of way we have been working for the monitoring the plant's growth. So each of the machine is now working to give the data. So all the data we put it to the knowledge to make more like uh, information how we can utilize for the purposes. So let me focus on harvesting part of automation, the last part, uh, outdoor mechanization. You can see ill map. This is in Thailand, actually. This is in Thailand. This is in Japan. With Japan, most of the combined we are using for like a, a GPS guidance systems. Now, it's a level two mechanization. We call level two. And this is a level zero or one. So still, uh, there are several parts. So the combined harvester we are using, header type and conventional type. So the Yanmar, they developed a new combined, automated combined, prototype one. So let me show you. These are the combined harvesters in the United States. They use for corn. But for the other part, their machine is too large. But this is not feasible for Asian agriculture because of the size of the machines and things. So we need to develop our own systems. So this is the robot we call field robots in Hokkaido University. So you can see the header type to, to feed the, the, the weight and corn. So this is already developed now in the prototype stage. So maybe within five to 10 years, you can see numbers of automated robots will come to the, to the market, market. Now I'm working in one company with them in the United States. So how the partial and the full autonomy works, how the robots, driverless, the market is coming. It's a huge market, people want to invest here. So this is autonomous tracking algorithm that we are working on, so leader follower. I told you that one would be driver, one would be the robot, without driver. So this is our work in our lab. So one of my PhD students working was a leader and follower. So we are still continuing this, uh, this research. So he's uh, now working in Honda now. So how we can follow one is a leader, another is the follower. Uh, this is some, some data, like uh, some accuracy data based on the different in our farm. Let's I hope this video should work. No, no. So we had, uh, anyway, I think it's not working. Uh, there was a one video, one is uh, leader and then there is the follower, like this one. This one is done in Hokkaido University. One is a leader. These are multiple robots. But in our case, in the leader follower one, uh, one is a driving and there is a following. One is following, following type. It's called field robots. So automation is moving very fast. It's not so, so smooth. Spraying is one of the things where the, we need really control the pesticides. 
for to to bring the safe food. Safety is very important. Now you can see in USA we do a lot of like uh, spraying the by airplane. Not in Asian countries. But in some of the cases, we use the horticultural crops. So we need to minimize these chemical inputs. Though we are work talking about agriculture, but the specialty crops also need uh, chemical. The variable rate sensors are in the field. We are using the map based on different types of variable rate sensors. So you can see that numbers of sensors uh, already in the coming to the field for working out. So let's see, I have some videos, so just to show you if it works. Okay, you can see that the the, num, uh, the automation is going very fast. So very small scale, large scales, smart springs, uh, vision systems. Uh, this is from my previous lab from United States. So the, we are trying to minimize the inputs as minimum as possible. Because the rice, the major corns, major grains is difficult to make organic, because huge numbers of like demands for like for food security. So this is our recent works. We are thinking to make more safety in agriculture with the automations. Uh, so this is, uh, for example, in in Japan, most of our farmers are average over 65. So how to make them give them a safe driving? So we have been working on in when they become tired, then we want to make the driving, manual driving to the autonomous driving. So when driver become fail of heart attack or something, cannot work anymore, so the machine would go as a robot. So this is my target. So for example, uh, I was uh, giving the sample for my students if I just uh, think. So this is the way we want to do for automations. So you can see we have a very high accuracy rate. So if it comes like within less than one second, like a, uh, ten, within ten, 10 milliseconds, we can recognize the health conditions based on the sensors. So it is not a contact sensor, it is a vision sensor. So we have been working. At any time, if farmers fail, then if it is working in a large field, for example, uh, it needs to risk a rescue. So the someone needs to come. In the meantime, the tractor would be autonomous, robot. It will come to a rescue zone to save the farmers. So industrial development, I would like to show you that near future application, how it comes. So the tractors, you see, the Yanmar already bring out, then K's already bring out, but the issue is still safety. So that's why Yanmar bring out leader follower systems, then K's bring out these systems, the John Deere's, and then also the John Deere already bring the Moir. So, so the autonomous tractors are not far away. You can see within 10 years it would be in the market. So. Each country has the different one. So let me focus on indoor mechanization shortly. So how the automation goes in plant factory and vertical gardens. So we are also working to make like a home-based robot, which I showed you a video here of aquaphonic systems. We are trying to make a small robot so it can come anywhere and give you lettuce on your field. And you can have a home garden and it can. So we are trying to develop with this sort of a small robotic platform for make the aquaphonics for lettuce and things. People doesn't need to go outside. They can have it inside the home. So this is the plant factory, smart gardens, and some of the examples for in the different countries, the vertical farms. So you want to bring out more in the closed homes. So this is the soilless cultures moving very fast worldwide because of the food security. We need to ensure, right? So that's the part. So the control environment is very important. There is a lots of automations. So not only the outdoor, the indoor has also lots of potentials. Our student needs to work out here. There is a huge markets in indoor also as well. So this is the technology in the livestock, as I showed. The livestock has a huge opportunity for mechanization and automations as well. So milking robot, animal, it's a very hard and tedious works. Why is the hard and tedious works? Automation and the precision is more important there. 
So as I was discussing with the rector that the highland is very important because it's very difficult to access. So more we need the automations there as well. So the last part is the software advancement. So mechanization is not only the machines and things. Now we have a software, right? Uh, 10 years ago, I can open my car and I can fix. Now I cannot fix anymore my car. Why? Because everything is now like a mechatronics, software based. Even if I open my car, it's out. I cannot do anymore. Even a few months back, I lost my key of my car. So I, because each car has immobilizers now. Even you make a mechanical key, it doesn't work. You must have an IC inside to immobilize. So software is very important, which coming forward for the huge like business opportunities. So there's an IoT in agriculture is coming out. So we have the huge opportunity in IoT, the clouds and satellites. So this is the decision support systems. I work in also in Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand, Bangladesh, Afghanistan, and India. And we also work in China as well to make different sort of softwares and decision support systems for each of the places. So satellite remote sensing, GIS. So we need more precision in the, like especially. So these are the part we are working. So yield mapping and biomass monitoring. This part is more like a software based. So how much yield we are expecting from the field and the land and the biomass as well. So the cloud seeding applications. So we are also working on like a, how much cloud rainfall can be can be expected from the satellite data because the rain is very important for us. So we are trying to work on the cloud seeding application, how much cloud we need and how much wire is the seeding, seeding agents we need to focus. So one of my students and uh, collaborating in Malaysia, especially where we use the seeding agents and then the rainfall comes to the reservoirs. So this sort of the research is also coming to in the fronts as well. So the ICT for the post service losses, in many countries we have 35% fruits loss, vegetable loss. So how does the ICT could help to reduce the post harvest losses uh, to, for the farmers and, uh, and the beneficiaries? There, there is, so industrial development and future uh, further extension, I think there are huge opportunity as well. So now you can see all the companies like uh, Kubota, they have smart assist systems. You can buy with a 3,000 yen, that means uh, 20 US dollar per month. They will give you all service. Yanmar has like a yearly $150. They will give you all service. But there is some point, once you buy, you would be very much dependent on them. So <laughs> it's not so easy. So now Kubota and Yanmar, they are selling one is uh, KCS, Kubota is smart assist systems. Yanmar has a smart assist systems. They are giving the lease of all these things. All farmers who ever sign up with Kubota, they will use their all data and things. So that's the advantage now. Of, uh, all of the Kubota, Yanmar and companies, they are using lots of outdoor softwares. This also connect to you, and you are also giving you data to them. So uh, this is one way that privacy also, data sharing is also a difficult part. So software in the climates, lots of softwares are coming, as also climate control systems as well. There is also lots of automation. Not only machine, not only indoor, software is also very important to control over. So our research direction, we are moving, development of autonomous guidance with UAV. Uh, I have the video in the different ones, so maybe sometimes later. So we are using now UAV like a drone to make more like a data because it has more flexibility for the, the robotic systems. Uh, this is a little bit messed up, like a, how the precision egg and how the genetics is very important. Not only the machines. Uh, my friend from uh, Korea, he will present the genetic adaptability because all the time machine doesn't work, you know. Maybe we need to unlock the genetic potentials. How the genetic potentials helps. If we have a drought resistant, if we have the different sorts of the things. So bioinformatics need to do that. That's also one type of like a biocomputing systems. So which variety, which things is very important at, the, at that place. 
I told you agronomy is very local. So particularly a very important thing is important there. So that's why we need to unlock the genetic potentials of the crops. So and also agronomic decision is very important, how to make the agronomic decisions. So we need to optimize the machines. We need to target the agronomy. Like in Thailand, which crops are very important, what area are important, not every area the same. So we need to focus like which area, say this is a low land, this is a plain land, this is a high land. So which crops are important, we need to target the agronomy. That agronomy is important there, that machine is important there. And then we need to do the data management. So when all these things comes with the things and we need to control the machine from the outside. That's what we call the outside control. And also, the, we need to unlock the genetic potentials. How, if all this works, definitely we can reach the, the target for the precision agronomics. I think uh, I have done, probably I took more time. So how do agriculture mechanization is very, very, very important. But some of the country is still, we need the different approach. Because Thailand, Japan, our farm size is very small. So we need a consolidated farm a larger farm, but Japan is moving because many farmers are more than 65, so they cannot use the farm anymore. So the consolidated farm is very important. In the United States, one farm is like a 1,000 acre, right? 250 acre, hectares. But in Japan, maybe one or two hectares, so it's very difficult to use. So now consolidated farm is very important. Then uh, field robots we need. <clears throat> for the labor shortages and the sensing, we need to utilize the sensing for machine optimization. Which machine, why it is important, right? I cannot bring the US machines because it doesn't work here. So we need to optimize our own machines. We need to think our own agronomy, how it works. In each agronomy is very local, we cannot compare. And data management, finally just, so not only that, automation also need for post-harvest processing. Because I told you, 35% we lost. So we need to minimize this loss. So, and then finally, indoor and software developments are also very important. Because uh, software is eating everywhere now, right? Software is grabbing our life. So we are become part of this. So software has lots of opportunity to work for sustainable uh, mechanization systems. So thank you very much. I would like to thank uh, to invite me and also uh, the, some of the professors helped me to give the, some of the data and informations and my graduate students as well. So thank you for uh, your patience. I'm sorry maybe my presentation was a little bit longer. So these are some of the references. Uh, if you're interested, I have several books on most of the presentation I covers from these books, like a bioproduction and engineering. So those came out for the precision agronomics, which I wanted to see the agronomy is very local. And we need to work out to solve this, to, to face the climate change and ensure the food security in regionally. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Professor, for an interesting talk. Now, if anyone has any questions, I'm sure Professor would be pleased to answer. <laughs> OK, maybe no question. <laughs> OK, that's good. <laughs> well, maybe been... they need to little bit think. Oh, yeah. I'm here, so if you have any questions. Sometimes, if you have a presentation, immediately no questions, because everybody is <laughs> in the maybe, mind. Yeah. Maybe it you takes some time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> maybe your presentation is very clear. <laughs> <laughs> OK. OK, okay let's next. OK. Mm, OK, for now. Mm, OK. For now, let's go to another guest question. Um, no, guest guest speaker, sorry. OK. Next, I would like to introduce you to the next topic, which is genetic factors involved in regional adaptation and a biotic stress tolerance in rice. By as, uh, Associate Professor Dr. Su Cho Yu, his background, his background education in doctoral degree is crop molecular genetics in Seoul National University uh, from Korea. 
He is an expert in crop molecular genetics from his back, uh, background and his work. For now, he is working in the Department of Plant Life and Environmental Science of uh, Hangyong National University. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming uh, Professor so uh, Su Cho Yu. Nice to meet you all. Uh, I'd like to thank, to, first of all, the, the committee members and Dr. Ray Rong uh, and, uh, for inviting me and giving me the chance to share my research uh, in this wonderful the Rangsin University. I, it, it's, it's very impressive to see the, what you are doing here. Uh, and the facility is quite good, and the, the faculty members are Wonderful. So I think I wish to learn from you. So, uh, <clears throat> so, uh, so I was invited to this conference. Then uh, I think I should have prepared a more general view for the agriculture, but I just uh, considered this conference as a just general one of the general conference. So I just prepared very specific uh, topics for regional adaptation of crop. Uh, cultivation. Uh, so uh, before I um, <clears throat> go to the, the main com main talk, I think I should prepare. Uh, the, it's better to show, show the introduce my lab. It is not uh, pref uh, prepared for this conference. It's for my students, so uh, it's not the professional the material. But uh, probably uh the student living and uh, the starting here might be interested in the some studying in korea then um so i maybe it's just it's better to sh uh, introduce uh, just five minutes so, so uh i'm i'm learning the crop molecular breeding lab uh so the main topic current research topic in my lab is isolation of agronomically valuable gene and qtl and the second, the elucidation of genetic me mechanism underlying plant senescence, and a lot of the, the, uh, the isolation and functional analysis of genes tolerant to abiotic stresses such as uh, salt, drought, heat, anaerobic germination, and summer and tolerance, that, might, which, uh, that uh, you may be interested in, especially in this area. And the gene and QTL pyramidings. Because not only one gene is not enough, so we should prepare the, multi, uh, the tolerance variety to the multi-stress stresses. So we try to combine this, uh, all the QTL and genes. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to move this, uh, and this is the map-based cloning, and uh, we uh, cloned. Uh, in the beginning of my research, I focused on the identify the genes underlying for the senescence and the plant development. But now I, uh, okay, QTL study. And uh, so this is one of the senescence studies. So we, uh, we are studying on how the plant uh, mature and how plant senescence. Uh, then the, we identified the, one of the, uh, the we, we uh, study on the, uh, the staggering mutant, so in which the, the senescence is blocked. Uh, so is, this is very good, useful materials to study uh, how, how plant is senescence. And this is all about distresses, drought, cold, submergence, phosphate deficiency, and uh, yeah, so and salt distresses. So I'm not going to talk about uh, that much for this topic today. So just to introduce, and then and this kind of the about the stress is very um, big problems in especially in the East and South Asian country. So so we want to combine all these genes uh, in the one elite varieties. 
But the problem is, you know, if you combine the, some the important gene, such as the PUF1 is the tolerance genes to the low P stress, the phosphate stress, and sub-one sub is the tolerance gene in, to, uh, to the uh, submergent stress. So if we combine these two genes, uh, in our recent study, in the PUF1 is not working. So this kind of thing is happening all the time. So uh, before we combine, uh, before we test the combining uh, capacity, so we don't know. So uh, we are like that. If we combine these two genes, the PUF1, uh, PUF1 is the effect is gone. So we are now studying why why PUF1 is suppressing the function of sub1. Ah, no, in, sorry, in, in opposite way. Why the sub? PUF1 alone is okay in the sub uh, in the P stress condition, but uh, if we combine the PUF1 and sub1, the the pop ones function is gone because of the presence of sub1. So this kind of the mechanism we are studying. Then okay, so so I'm going to go to my uh, my presentation. Uh, so not here. Uh, okay, uh, where is my? Can you find? Okay, thank you. So today uh, I'm going to talk about the genetic factors involved in the regional adaptation and the virus stress in rice. Uh, so the, this is Korea map, and uh, this is Seoul, and the Seoul is surrounded by the capital area, Gyeonggi Province. So the HKNU is located in the Gyeonggi Province. So this is the, one, uh, the only one national university located in the, in the Gyeonggi Province, because the company, uh, the, not company, the government. Uh, prevent the building of the university, establishment of the university in this area to prevent the, the, uh, the increasing density of population. So we are lucky university. <laughs> and even though the university is quite small, uh, the way the around 600, 5, 500 people, the student, and uh, 2,200 faculty members, it's not that big university, but this university is originated from the agricultural university. Mm -hmm. So the, the faculty members in this university, in agricultural field is quite active. So I hope we can do a lot of collaboration. So um, today I'm going to talk about the recent adaptation, especially focusing on the flowering time gene, because it's very critical uh, for the, the crop, 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 recent adaptation of crop cultivation. And if I have time, I may share some other uh, research, uh, current research topics here. So why is the reasonable adaptation of crop plants critical? As you all know, so, uh, the increase in global demand for Japonica and the Indica rice. So Jap the demands of in Japonica rice variety is increasing in the region where Japan Indica rice is largely consumed and vice versa. So if we grow the plant, Japonica plant in the low latitude region, we can see this kind of extreme early flowering with the reduced yield. So, uh, so the many people I mean, now is the migrating. To, so a lot of people eating Japonica rice living in this area, and also a lot of people eating the Indica rice living in the northern area. So uh, we should solve this problem. We should uh, uh, grow the plant in in the right place. Uh, so, and also the, the second reason is the in, increasing demands for the co tolerant crop variety uh, to the high temperature and other about stresses due to the global warming. So cultivation reason is rapidly changing toward the north. So uh, as we see here, uh, the, this is one of the example. Uh, the cultivation area for the apple uh, is now the moving to the north and uh, depend on the, because the temperature rise. So maybe 
uh, and maybe a, a few uh, decades later, maybe we cannot grow the, the apple anymore in South Korea. Maybe we should import the, the, from the North Korea over China, probably. So this is a big issue. And the other one is the more frequent occurrence of the biotic stresses, such as drought, salt, heat, and uh, submergence. So then what would be main factors determining regional adaptation of rice? So as I said, it's flowering time. And the other one is about the stresses. So and the rice uh, determine transition from vegetative to reproductive phase by sensing photo period and the temperature. So this is the, uh, the stage of rice, uh, rice growth, especially in vegetative phase. Uh, vegetative phase, there is two kind of phase, the basic vegetative phase and temp uh, photo period sensitive uh, phase or temperature sensitive phase. So if the uh, plant, uh, plant get, the, get the signal from outside, temperature and the photo period, uh, day length to induce flowering. So uh, if, they have, if the plant has very strong photo period sensitivity, they, uh, they have the wrong duration of rice growth. So this is a ge geographical map of rice cultivation. So uh, rice, the wild rice basically originated from the low latitude region in this area in Thailand. Uh, northern limit of the wild rice is uh, around the 25 degree of north. And, but current, uh, current northern limit of cultivated Asian rice is up to the right, North Korea, South uh, China, and Sapporo in Japan. So what, what made possible for the rice to grow in the northern region? Uh, this is geographical level of rice cultivation. Japonica rice is growing in the northern region and uh, to, uh, or 38 degree of, uh, in the south. But Indica rice is in the low latitude region. The Japonica, uh, why Japonica rice can grow in the northern limit area? Because it has weak and uh, no, low photo period sensitivity and the flower extremely early in the long day condition. This northern limit is, is long, long day condition. So if we have the information of natural uh, variation in the flowering time and the photo period sensitivity, we may have good information for the uh, regional, adapt, regional and the se uh, seasonal adaptation of crops. So, uh, Probably I'm, it's not a good idea to go into too much detail, so uh, maybe I can pass, uh, uh, I will explain roughly. So the, the Japanese group and the Yano groups uh, identified the 17 heading date QTLs. Heading date means it's the uh, same meaning uh, with, as the flowering time because uh, heading, heading, the pentacle heading, pentacle headed at the time of flowering day. So, Heading date can be considered as same meaning with flowering time. So uh, this, the Yano group identified 17 heading date QTLs and its map. And uh, some of them, around more than 10, were cloned. The gene was cloned for that QTL. And so some of the combination determines, some of the earlier combination of the QTLs uh, determine the regional adaptation. So you might be, uh, know, you may know the nonabokra uh, is a quite extreme late flowering plant. And the earlier analysis revealed that nonabokra has quite the functional combination of the flowering time gene alleles, all the colored in blue. But one of the genes growing in the northern limit in Sapporo, Hayamasari plant, has a non-functional allele combination, at least four non-functional allele combination, colored in the red. So it's a non-functional allele, and it's important for the uh, to determination of rice crop cultivation. So elucidation of rice flowering mechanism and uh, 
and it's very important, and the gene coupling is important to rice determ determination, uh, adaptation. So this kind of approach can be, uh, this kind of information can be applied to rice breedings. So previously, uh, this one is the, the simple flowering pathway. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna explain more in detail in later. So one of the genes in flowering pathway, HD1 and HD3A, uh, is uh, promote, contribute to diversity of flowering time. The, the, this uh, Koshimamoto group in Japan reported this. And the other groups in, in China, Kifa Zhang groups also reported that loss of function, which is non-functional, uh, allele of the HD4 and HD5 alleles contribute to the rice cultivation in the cooler region. Uh, this is the GHD7 study and this HD5 study. And this is the simplified the flowering time pathway in rice. So HD3A in the RFT1 is the key floral uh, regulators, uh, the, the, which is also, they are also log of the uh, APT, flowering locus T in Arabidopsis. So these genes expressed in the leaf and moved to the apex where it induced the floral organ identity gene. So this is long distance movement gene, it's a very famous gene. And, and this gene, for the flowering, this gene should be uh, highly uh, expressed. But interestingly, this gene is regulated by EHD1 and HD1. This is another key gene. So, and also, the H EHD1 is regulated by a bunch of genes. Look at that. Here the, the, in the, right, the, green, blue, the green box, it's all this one uh, induced EHD1. All the genes in the red box suppress the, the, the EHD1. So today, I'm going to talk about the, how HD1 of the genes, HD16 and the PR37, works and how they contributed the recent adaptation of rice. Uh, 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 rice. Okay, so the uh, PR37 and EL, EL1. PR37 represent the uh, pseudo response regulator 37, EL1 is early flowering one. So we had, uh, before in SNU, we had uh, the H143 is the early flowering gene, early flowering plant, and the we and the Mirang 23 is the Tongil type cultivar. This cultivar contributed to the uh, the green revolution in Korea in the back back in 1972. So uh, Mirang uh, the H143 is extremely early flowering plant. Showed look at as you see here. So this two heading is quite. Uh, read, uh, quite short uh, days to heading, and the Midang 23 is uh, flower, long, flower late. And we crossed these two, and we did the QTL analysis, and we uh, identified two QTL, EH7-1 and EH7-2. And, but this one, this location is quite correspondent, uh, uh, consistent with the uh, uh, the HD, HD4 and H2 location, which is determined by the Yano group. And another group is identified, GHD7 is located in this HD4. But P at that time, PR37 was not determined. So uh, we, we, sequenced the whole, we sequenced the whole genome of HD143 and the, the two parents, Mirang23 that we compared the sequence. This, this is a previously identified the gene sequence, GHD sequence. And Mirang sequence was quite matched to the, exactly matched to the GHD, which is functional. And the other one, H143, is non-functional. It, the uh, missense mutation happened. So a, a premature stop codon uh, generated here. So this is non-functional. So, uh, because of non, uh, you know, the GHT70A means non-functional earlier over GHT7, and this one, the, according to the 
the Kipa Jangor's report, this non-functional allele contributed to the expansion of rice cultivation region to the north. And the other one, the other non-functional alleles, GHT7-0, also contributed, but uh, pro it definitely it uh, pro the contributed to uh, the early flowering. Uh, but but uh, it's grown as uh, early rice in the two uh, rice crop system. So uh, it contributed to, cool ri uh, to the rice crop systems by the promoting flowering. So next we focused on, because the, e, this QTL was already identified, so we focused on the, the second QTL, HD2. So we, uh, here, so in the biomapping, we identified the 185 gene in total, and uh, this is the total eight genes, and four out of the, the eight, Four out of the eight genes was retrotransposon, so this is not the flowering gene, so we removed uh, out of the candidate, and the PR37 was a uh, candidate. So, so we, we, we confirmed that the PR37, uh, the non-functional allele exists in the H143, and to the, uh, the observe the effect of the, this non-functional allele, we prepared the HNIL the line. This line uh, is near isenic line differs at specific QTL, the segregating here only here. Then we identified uh, we found the two lines segregating only in the H, the PR37 allele, but um, but in other a lot of flowering time QTLs where there's no, there's no difference. So we observed also, you know, the early flowering phenotype of that allele in this two line. And we also uh, uh, analyzed the tDNA insertion of mutant, knockout mutant. And the tDNA knockout mutant also the showed the early flowering. So this then then we, uh, uh, you know, you know, the, we we identified, we confirmed the function of the PR37 non-functional alleles, and then also in the previous report in the sorghum, um, they they reported that the O the OS PR37, I mean, uh, the sorghum PR37 contributed to the. Uh, The early photo, uh, early flowering in, uh, and also uh, the reduced the non-functional allele of sorghum PR37 uh, contributed the reduced. F uh, okay, here the uh, the cultivation in the temperate uh, zone worldwide because sorghum is a tropical plant. So because of this allele, the this the sorghum was made the sorghum cultivation region was expanded to the so the temperate zone. So this that means this. Gene is very critical for the rice cultivation. So we also check the natural variation in nucleotide and amino acid sequence in Indica and Japonica. And we found out the various Indica specific and Japonica specific non-functional allele. And, and also the PR37 is very, the, we, we now we are handling this one. But previously, GHT7, as we talked before, is also critically important. Uh, for the regional adaptation. So we, com we compare, uh, we check the, these two alleles. So in Indica groups, Jensen 27, 97 has a two non-functional allele, and in Japonica, H143 has two non-functional allele. So, okay, I think I'm gonna move to here and I'm gonna talk about this one. So uh, in two non-functional allele plants uh, only found in the northern limit region, and the other non-functional combination was found in the a little bit lower latitude region, uh, because the, this kind of this Jensen 97 contributed to the two cropping system. In 
for the two cropping system, the flowering uh, should be promoted very uh, uh, extremely. So that means the, the GHD, GHD7 and the PR37 allele variant is quite important and critical uh, to determine the rice um, adaptation. And we observed how, in the molecular level, how the PR37 is uh, regulate the flowering time gene. And in the, in, in the Dongji in the wild type plant, and the PR37 is a mutant plant, we compared the expression pattern of the flowering time gene in two different plants. And interestingly, all the other gene is not altered, but HD3A is uh, quite altered. That means uh, the PR37 directly repress the HD3A. Uh, so the tr 3 a and HD3A is, uh, the pathway is independent from the HD1 and EHD1 pathway. So which is a little bit different from the previous report. So uh, my first conclusion is so we uh, we identified the QT, EHT, uh, EHT 7 2 QTLs conferring the extreme, extremely early flower early heading under natural long day condition in H143, and also we re re revealed that the PR37 is responsible for the EHT uh, EHT 7 2 and HD2 QTLs. And natural variation of PR37 and GHD7 has contributed to rice cultivation to a wide range of latitude. And the PR37 delays heading by repressing HD3A directly under LD conditions. So uh, we next, uh, you know, the, we identified the two major QTL uh, from the one uh, H143, but there was one minor QTL so we called it in uh, AEH3 in chromosome 3. So uh, the we, but in this region, there is two gene, two HD QTL uh, exist, and the HD6 and the HD16. But you know, when we analyze the sequence, so we identify, we, we found that the HD143 uh, and the Mirang23 has a functional HD6. So we removed this one. Then, and pro probably HD16 would be the target gene. So uh, we did fine mapping, and we found out that there is some uh, earlier uh, mutation happens in the CK1. Then we observed the the sequence. Uh, we observed the con, uh, whether it's conserved or not in the all different uh, species. So we realized that uh, you know the the glycine uh, located in the 159th nucleotide is well conserved among species. So. This kind of the the substitution earlier the substitution. Uh, amino acid substitution caused the non-function of this CK1, we predicted. And previously, the people uh, reported that Kosikari also has some, Kosikari also has the, uh, the, the uh, promote early flowering, Kosikari the you know, genotype. So we analyzed the sequence, and we found that also in Kosikari, uh, the variety, some the early mutation happened in other reason of the kinase domain. So, th um, as I talked uh, before, the HNIL the line, which is very useful line to observe the effect effect of this this gene. And we also confirmed that uh, using the, the Mirang 27, the functional types HNIL we compared and the non-functional type HNIL. And, and the non-functional type HNIL showed the early flowering. So we confirmed also with the HNIL line. 
So one more interesting thing is in the previous report, they said uh, uh, ER1 is functioning in the phosphorylation of the SLR protein in G8 response, response pathway. Uh, so to understand whether this CK1 gene, uh, the EL1 gene is called encoding CK1 is functional or not, a good way, good way is to, uh, to check to the phosphorylation activity. So uh, we purified his, his fuse in the EL1 and we prepared also SL, SL uh, R1 gene and we incubated this too and we found out that this EL1, this is kinase protein, um, the phosphorylated SLR1, as we see here. The so Mirang is, is uh, 23, the functional type uh, can phosphorylate this the target protein, but failed with the non-functional type. That means the EL1 HC143 encodes uh, non-functional CK1 proteins. But, and in other, report, they said um, the CK1 also can do self-phosphorylation. So we also observed the self-phosphorylation, uh, uh, self-phosphorylated by the EL1, uh, the, the Mirang 23. But self-phosphorylation was not uh, observed with the EL1 in non-functional type. Then, uh, But the problem is in, uh, the, <coughs> the SRI, SRL protein, the, the non-functional the mutant of SRL protein is not related to the flowering. So EL1, we conclude that uh, the EL1 CK1 function in the suppression of LD-dependent flowering by phosphorylating, not SRL1, but unidentified target protein that downregulate EH1 expression. So uh, we also observed the, the role of the EL1 variant in ge geographical distribution. As observed in the PRL mutation, we also observed the non-functional types of Japonica mut uh, mutant allele contributed to the northern region of the rice cultivation. And uh, we, we checked the expression pattern of flowering gene in this uh, knockout, the, in the mutant. And EHD1 and HD3A in the RFT1 is the expression level is quite in, in, enriched. Uh, it's highly expressed, uh, but no significant difference observed in the upper stream genes. So which means EL1 regulate the EHD1 and uh, EHD1 uh, expression and uh, the RFT1 and HD3A is regulated by EHD1. So we don't know the target protein here. So EL1 um, possibly the phosphorylate some of the target protein to regulate EHD1 expression. So in the previous report, they said a CK1 phosphorylated GHT7 Okay, I think I check. But in the genetic analysis, uh, uh, HD2 in the epistatic to the HD, not only the CK HD6, HD6 is CK uh, uh, the, the H2 is H2 is PL7, PL37 uh, QTL is apostatic to the HD16. Also, HD2 is apostatic to the, the HD6, which means the H, uh, HD2 is located in the downstream of the HD16 or HD6. So we hypothesis that the CK1 regulate not only GHD7, and also phosphorylate PRL37. So another report that the CK2 uh, phosphorylate, phosphorylate uh, the PRL37. So uh, 
uh, we checked whether really the CK1 and the CK2 phosphorylate PRL37 protein. So first we observed whether these are interacting each other or not. So uh, we prepared the uh, his views, the PRL37 and, and, and his uh, the MBP, maltose binding protein as control. And we incubated with the GS control and the GS, GS diffused ACK2 alpha. And we pulled down uh, this, this one and with the GSD resin and found PR37 with the, his MBP, the antibody. And we successfully identified the, identified the the PR37 in this pull down the mixture. So which means CK2 alpha and PR37 is interact. And, and the CK1 also uh, the detected in the pull down with uh, the CK1, uh, the, with, with, with the PR37. That means CK1 also interact with uh, PR37. This is in vitro assay. So this assay also confirmed in the bi FC assay, which is the in vivo assay. So we used the, the, as a positive control, the alpha 3 and alpha 4 interaction. We see the signal here. And in the CK2 and the PR37 interaction also observed here. The CK1 and the PR37 interaction also observed. And, and next, we well, after after observing the interaction exists between the CK1 and CK2 and PR37, and we checked whether they also phosphorylate and PR37. And here, uh, so we uh, the, in the reaction we identified the PR37. Uh, was phosphorylated and LHY is the positive control, is known to be phosphorylated by CK2 alpha. So this indicates that CK2 alpha phosphorylated PR37. And the CK1 also uh, phosphorylated by P, uh, I mean, uh, phosphorylate PR37. But this control was not phosphorylated. But this one just uh, taught to represent the autophosphorylation of CK1. So next we we check the and okay the CK1 and CK2 phosphorylated PR37 and which part of the PR37 was phosphorylated. So we, we divided the PR37 into three different uh, fragment and N terminal and the medium and the C terminal and we we found that the CK2 alpha only phosphorylated in the medium part, and CK1 uh, the phosphorylated in the medium and medium part and the C terminal part, and the full length were also, of course, is phosphorylated. So, based on this result, we uh, concluded that CK2 alpha phosphorylated the medium part of the PR37, and CK1 phosphorylated uh, the medium and the C terminal part of the PRL37. And previously we reported that the PRL37 directly regulate HD3A, but this regulation reported by other groups, but we are not sure for this reaction. So this is the final the pathway um, the, based on the, our result. And CK1 phosphorylate uh, the GHD7, this is previous report. In, in this report, we reported that CK1 and CK2, both of them phosphorylated the PR37 to regulate directly HD3A. So this is the conclusion for uh, second conclusion. Uh, PR37 repressed HD3A independent of HD major pathway, HD1 and EHD1, to suppress flowering under LD. And this the natural variation of the major genes, PR37 and GHD7, mainly contribute to the rice adaptation in the northern limit region. And the CK1 
uh, phosphorylated uh, PLA37 and THT7, both of them to repress uh, flowering under natural long day condition, uh, long day condition. and natural uh, variation of EL1, including CK1, contributed to the northward expansion of rice cultivation reasons. So, so this re uh, results indicate that the coupling of the heading date gene alleles are very critical to, to rice adaptation. So later, another pit groups also reported that not only that gene, but the EHD1, HD3A, and RFT1, the downstream gene, the, the major uh, flowering regulator, also contributed to the, uh, the expansion of right cultivation region, uh, especially RFT1 is very important uh, because it's, uh, it's uh, the floral pro promoters, especially under LD condition, because the northern limit region is LD condition. That's why this, the role of RT, RFT one earlier is very critical. So another one also reported. So, uh, so I'm, I'm going to share in uh, probably in 10 minutes, I'm going to share the, my uh, the current uh, project briefly. And so, uh, so as I, I talked, allele combination of the flowering gene is very critical for reason adaptation. So in the high throughput analysis on the genetic composition of flowering gene in the core population of Korean rice variety. Uh, this is, so for this purpose, I, uh, we uh, sequenced the 300 Korean rice variety, whole genome sequence. We got and we performed the GWAS analysis to identify key flowering gene contributed to the Korean rice variety development. And all combining combination profiling of the flowering gene determining heading date and about to stress tolerance is very important. If we know the, the information, uh, what kind of earlier combination uh, contributed to, uh, was, was used to breed the Korean variety uh, it, then it's very good tools uh, for the further breeding uh, in the project. Also, the, the, some, lots of the flowering gene is cross-talking with the abiotic stress tolerance. So some of the combination has good abiotic stress tolerance, but some of the combination is not. So not only we should consider the flowering time regulation, but also whether they have good performance in the vital stress is also very important. And if we develop the intermediate uh, parental uh, the varieties with various heading date and uh, various the elite agronomic trait, it can be used for rapid breedings later. So this is the one of the examples for the GWAS analysis. So we, uh, in the from out of the, the from the GWAS analysis with the 300 Korean rice core cultivars, as we identified the HD gene, heading date gene, and one of the gene is the, B, uh, the flowering BHLH1, uh, which is not the, uh, reported before. That means you know, this kind of, the, kind of very specific uh, unknown gene also contributed to the, uh, the, f the flowering determination of Korean rice variety. So it is, it is it's worth to check the, all the allele combination of flowering gene in the Thailand or in the, the rice collection in the uh, northern, uh, this, in the uh, low latitude region, also very important and can be useful information. And the other one is related to the Korean, uh, North Korean rice varieties. So we, we try to f functionally elucidate the key genetic factors related to the reasonable adaptation and the vital stress tolerance in North Korean rice variety. So we tested the 4,000 North Korean rice variety in the Philippines, which is in lower latitude region. And, and if, as we talked, if we grow then the, the Japanese rice in, in low latitude region, and most of them uh, show the extreme early flowering with reduced yield. So then we identified, we selected 192 varieties with normal flowering and agronomical trait. 
So, and that means they have the, not the, they very weak or no fun, uh, the photoperiod sensitivity. So this is good uh, tools to, uh, to, to understand the, how the photoperiod sensitivity is uh, determined. And uh, the selected 200 varieties were tested in the high temperature greenhouse condition as well because, because we, uh, to develop the, uh, the tolerance variety in high temperature, heat stress condition. So we tested this one. And this is uh, the, the picture for the uh, plant tested in the Philippines. And we selected the normal flowering and the normal agricultural trait. So we compared this, uh, the, compared the, the, the data in Philippines and in high temperature condition of Korea. Interestingly, the flowering time is quite consistent. That means that it is not affected by the photo period because this latitude is quite different. So, but the flowering is interestingly uh, in this one, the, the, the blue, blue dot is Korean core cultivar, uh, 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 Korean area. And the flowering time was reduced, which means it's not the photo, the sensitive to the photo period, but sensitive to the temperature. So only the temperature sensitive the plants were uh, selected. But fertility in the high temperature condition, some fertility is, uh, is good, some, but uh, some fertility is not good. So we, we uh, observed the correlation of fertility and the flowering time. And in and, and, and the late flowering plant, plant has the low fertility and, and the early flowering plant in Korea is high uh, fertility. So this, we selected this, this plant with no function, no photoperiod sensitivity and heat stress tolerance, and, but uh, they have strong uh, temperature, uh, the temperature sensitivity. So now we are uh, working uh, with this, all these kind of the, uh, materials to develop the uh, his stress tolerant variety for, for the, of the North Korean rice variety. But nowadays, the, the some situation is the relationship between the North Korea and South Korea is getting better. So I think it's, it's, it's time to prepare the, the material for the breedings for North Korean uh, people. So the, my, the, this is the conclusion. So the same conclusion, the first one, same conclusion. But second one is the flowering genes cross-talking with abiotic stress tolerance need to be elucidated. So a lot, a lot of the, the quite uh, many the flowering genes are cross-talked with abiotic stress tolerance. So it should be elucidated. And uh, all the combination of HD genes detected in the core Korean variety would provide important genetic information for rice breeding. And the analysis of NK North Korea rice gemplasm would contribute to the mining of new useful genetic factors for photoperiod sensitivity and resin adaptation and NK rice breeding. Because it was not studied well, so that we may uh, identify the good uh, genetic resources. So this is uh, not intended for presentation, but uh, just I briefly I will introduce the MS11, where the developed the Japonica rice adapted to in this low latitude region, the Philippines. So, uh, but the, the plant in this region is uh, the subject to the, a lot of drought stress and the submergent stress and the low pea stress. So, and the cell salinity tolerance, uh, salinity stress. So uh, we now, we, we, uh, uh, we developed uh, the rice variety, Japonica rice variety adapted to the low latitude region and with this uh, about stress tolerance genes. So sub one, sub one is for the, uh, sub one is for the submergence and anaerobic germination gene, drought gene, uh, salt tolerance gene, low pit stress gene, heat stress gene. 
And uh, we, uh, as, we, as we talked in, in the beginning, if we combine some of the gene if, with the pyramiding, some of the gene is not working. So uh, we are now uh, trying to figure out what's going on for the uh, underlying these two genes or three gene combination. Okay, this is, <laughs> this is the, I mean, you all know, right? So uh, please support the, this kind of the situation. So I gonna, uh, yeah, just a acknowledgement. So I have uh, lab members, uh, two doctoral course student and a master course student. And uh, this one, this work, the long time work was um, collaborated with the uh, Namcheon Baek of National University. And the GWAS study was uh, now is going on with uh, Yongjin Park and the Isu, Yu Isu. And the uh, Philippine works in the, the working with the Junghyun Jin. So it used to be in the, the ED step. Before now, is a professor in the Sejong National University. Okay, thank you so much for your attention. Yeah. Thank you so much, Professor. Um, for now, if anyone have any question, free free in this time. <laughs> okay, we got one person. I have two questions. Yeah. One is very normal. So could you please give some suggestion? How could we use the benefit gene from Japonica rice to improve indica grow in lowland in Thailand? Because you say so many limitations between the two subspecies. So your question is how I can use the gene in Philippine, Philippine gene? Benefit gene from Japonica to yeah. improve indica grow in lowland Thailand in grow in lowland in Thailand. Thailand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as, as we talked, uh, as I uh, introduced uh, in the presentation, and so we, we successfully uh, the developed the, M, the Japonica rice adapted to this the Philippine, but MS, which is called the MS11. But uh, still, uh, that MS11 has a weak in the biotic stress and also the biotic stress. So that's why we are trying to get, uh, the, tr trying to uh, the introduce all the about stress genes. So, uh, but the MS labor derived from the Korean cultivars. And so we now tested all the, the, the Korean, North Korean varieties, and we selected the 192 varieties out of 4,000 uh, varieties, which is very good materials. Um, but uh, may maybe it can be used in Thailand as well. But uh, it's. But I, I I don't know whether you you have the Japanese rice variety in Thailand. Yeah, we do. Uh, we, you have right. Yeah, our upland rice. Several of them are Japanese, and right. have several good trade. But we when we cross with indica, several times we don't get the trade we really need to. So I think it's worth to check the. Uh, some uh, some about this stress genes. We are now currently developing the markers over the uh, about this stress genes, as I listed in the table. Uh, yeah, then we can uh, screen that one, and we also have good facility to screen the about this stress uh, phenotype. So I think uh, we can do collaboration to screen the work the Japanese rice in the in the in Thailand, and uh, maybe we can develop together. Yeah. Hmm. Sorry. Uh, we have several tropical Japonica rice. Yeah. But the problem in Thailand, we cannot send the material outside the country. So if we do thing, we have to do in here. Oh, you cannot send out to the other country because no, the, the yeah. Nagoya <laughs> right, agreement, right? I understand. No, we yeah. cannot. Yeah. Also, you know, we, we should test the, the MS11 the population with the all different uh, about the stress gene. We, test, we should test it in the tropical region. Uh, so now we, we, we were contacting the Indonesia, but it has some problems. So, so probably we can, uh, we can, I mean, we can uh, make some connection for this work. 
right? Thank you. I hope, right? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And also another question on GWAS, because it's a lot of resource, and our lab probably cannot do that by sequencing several thousand of rice. Mm -hmm. But do you think, uh, can we use QTL sequencing? rather than GWAS to identify a candidate gene or some target gene that we are interested in? Yeah, of course. Of course, the, the, uh, there are some the, good, the pros and cons for the, between the GWAS and the QTL mapping. Yeah, and, uh, and in, the, in the GWAS, we cannot see the interaction effect between the, the, some Q, the genes. But in the QTL, we can see the interaction effect. And also, the QTL is still is one of the good way to identify gene. And so that's why, I'm, that's why we are doing, still doing the QTL mapping. So, but the GRS is, we can quickly, we can screen as long as we have the information of all the sequenced data. Right? So I think we should use both of them. After, after we identify gene from the QWAS analysis, and we should test, yeah, we should also test the, some, some other interaction between QTLs in the, in the population. Uh, right. But do you think can we use QTL sequencing for multiple gene, not single gene? QTL, QTL se sequencing. QTL sequencing? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we can. I mean, the just uh, you mean you you're talking about the method the Q, QTL seq or just the sequencing of QTL? No, QTL seq. Just Q, QTL seq, right? Yeah. Yeah, QTL seq also is a good way to uh, identify the the candidate gene, right, yeah. for the QTL. So we're also using that QTL seq approach. So if we talk if we the uh, the Oh, right, the identified uh, some uh, target gene. Uh, but QTLC was, I think, is, is can be applied still. A good approach, I think. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Any more questions? Thank you very much for your question, and thank you very much, Associate Professor Dr. Chu Shi Yu. Next, I would like to bring you guys to the last topics. A new brewing process of Japanese rice wine sake with sterilization by high hydrostatic pressure, which is presented by Professor Dr. Shinge Masutoru from Faculty of Applied Life Science, Nikata University of Pharmacy, and Applied Life Science, Japan. Professor Dr. Shinge Masutoru got a postdoctoral fellow at New Energy and Industrial Technology Development Organization at the University of Tokyo in 1997. He got a doctoral degree in Agriculture, Department of Biotechnology, Graduate School of Agricultural and Life Science, the University of Tokyo in 1995. From 2008, 2012 to that, he is a professor at Graduate School of Applied Life Science, Nikata University of Pharmacy and Applied Life Science, Japan. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Shinge Masutoru. Good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you for your nice introduction. I'd like to uh, thank everyone, especially for uh, Professor Dr. Ankasis for uh, invitation and uh, gave me a uh, great opportunity to talk about our research. And uh, oh, okay. And uh, for uh, for the agricultural innovation for sustainable future, uh, it is very important for the uh, uh, mechanization agriculture uh, talked by Professor Ahmed is quite impo important, very, very important for enhanced uh, uh, effectiveness for, of agriculture. And uh, of course, uh, molecular bleeding of rice crops uh, talked by Professor Yu 
is also uh, very, very, very in important for agricultural innovation. And uh, I'm so interest, impressed in the molecular broad breeding for expand cultivation area of Japanese rice is uh, <laughs> quite imp uh, impressive. And uh, another point, uh, okay. uh, the downstream of uh, agriculture is also important. Um, today's my talk is on uh, food processing area. Increasement, uh, increased food processing and the food production uh, give us, gives us uh, enhanced demand of uh, agricultural produ product. So I'm so in impressed, impressed by the uh, rice uh, products uh, just outside this room uh, made by the students of Rancid University. Um, food manufacturing and food processing uh, is the third important thing for uh, agricultural innovation for sustain sustainable future. So let's get start my presentation. Sorry. Okay. Uh, today's my topic is on. Uh, yeah. New brewing process of Japanese rice wine, sake, with sterilization by high hydrostatic pressure. Yesterday, I came from uh, Niigata, Japan. Um, Niigata Prefecture, Japan, is a... Uh, uh, very large uh, rice production, about 8.4% uh, of total in Japan uh, was uh, produced, produced in uh, Niigata Prefecture. Uh, based on uh, the large rice production, oh, oh, sorry, rice production, Japanese sake, which is made of rice, so Japanese sake brewing industries have been activated. Uh, about 10% of total sake is uh, brewed in Niigata Prefecture. And uh, here I'd like to show you the typical brewing process of Japanese rice wine, uh, steam, steamed rice and the koji mold and the yeast were, are mixed and uh, in, the, in the tank, cold uh, mold uh, play a role, of, role for uh, sacrification of rice starch to produce glucose. And uh, East Sacramento Service uh, act the conversion from glucose to ethanol. This is the fermentation process. And uh, Usual uh, Japanese sake sh should be stopped the fermentation because, uh, to prevent uh, over fermentation uh, by these microorganisms. So you, uh, maybe the Japanese sake in uh, Thailand uh, is uh, heat treat uh, thermal sterilization uh, Japanese sake. Thermal sterilization is uh, very important for uh, better shelf life, but um, the original taste and the flavor were unfortunately changed. So our final goal of this study is alternation of thermal sterilization by non-thermal sterilization technologies, which allows 
uh, inactivation of microorganisms while retaining the original sensory properties. That is my, uh, my dream and my goal of this tr study. And we used high hydrostatic pressure technologies. Uh, as you know, uh, when you dive into the ocean, the pressure, hydrostatic pressure increased. The most high, high, uh, high pressure region is uh, here, uh, uh, sorry. Um, um, uh, in the Pacific Ocean, uh, Mariana Trench, uh, about uh, 10,000 meters depth, where uh, the 100, 100 megapascal pressure, uh, uh, sorry, <laughs> and uh, pressure is, uh, pressure level is uh, 100, uh, 100 megapascals. Over the 100 megapascal, uh, microorganisms stop growth and uh, gradually, uh, gradually inactivated. And uh, you can use such kind of uh, machine, high pressure uh, apparatus, and uh, easily uh, apply the high pressure over 100 megapascals to samples and uh, inactivate without uh, heating. Non thermal sterilization by uh, HHP was applied to sake making. So we are now uh, making this uh, process, new process for Japanese sake brewing. After fermentation, uh, we put the filtered raw sake and uh, uh, containing fermentation mass, which includes yeast cells into uh, pl plastic bottles and uh, arrow them to second fermentation. And uh, after about uh, one week, uh, these bottles are applied for HHP sterilization. And uh, recently, uh, prototype HHP sake, Awanama, was uh, successfully uh, produced. Uh, this is maintain, um, this maintained the original taste and flavor without heat treatment and uh, sparkling like uh, champagne uh, wine uh, during the second fermentation. Awa means uh, sparkling and nama is uh, uh, raw in Japanese language. And uh, this is the result of uh, viable cell counts of microorganisms in uh, sake samples. Uh, without high, high pressures, uh, you can see the uh, 10 to 7 levels of yeast and uh, lactic acid bacteria and other bacteria. And uh, but uh, uh, after high, high hydrostatic pressure at uh, 200 megapascal, just 10 minutes without heat, uh, the uh, yeast was disappeared, inactivated, and uh, after storage to two weeks and four weeks, uh, but uh, unfortunately, yeast uh, was detected. So 200 megapascal 10 minutes was in a, insufficient for inactivation of microorganisms. But uh, 400 megapascals at, uh, for 10 minutes treatment uh, 
yeast and uh, lactic acid bacteria were, were uh, completely inactivated, even uh, for weeks storage. Mm. Uh, but uh, you can see the uh, quite high level of uh, bacteria. And uh, we analyzed them, uh, and uh, these bacteria were uh, spore forming, but it's megatherium uh, by 16S ribosomal RNA gene sequences. And uh, these bacteria doesn't, uh, don't uh, change the flavor and the taste and the safety in the Japanese sake. So, uh, it, um, it's, it's okay even uh, we detected this bacteria. And uh, high, high hydrostatic pressure at 200 megapascal was insufficient for a long uh, week, uh, long period storage, and uh, 400 megapascal was uh, necessary. And uh, preservation test using 400 megapascal uh, prototype sake were, are undergoing at the present. And uh, in the economic point of view, a uh, lower level of pressure is favorable because uh, uh, high, high pressure apparatus is not so cheap and quite expensive. So uh, we attempted to try to generate a pressure sensitive, mm, sorry, pressure sensitive uh, we, we call piezo-sensitive saccharomyces cerevisiae yeast mutant generated by ultraviolet radiation mutagenesis. And uh, this is a viable cell count of the parent strain wide type in blue bars. And the uh, red bars sh shows uh, the mutant and the high pressure treatment uh, for uh, six minutes at uh, 175, 200, and 225 megapascal. You can, uh, you can see the mutant inactivated compared with the wild type in, uh, in the around 200 megapascal uh, pressure levels. Mutant. This mutant shows a significant loss of viability compared with the wider type, which allows us to inactivate a lower pressure levels. But uh, uh, we must uh, confirm uh, the fermentation ability. This is the uh, glucose consumption of wild type and mutant and the ethanol production of the, these two strains. Uh, you, can, uh, you cannot find the difference of these two results, so the, this mutant uh, showed the equivalent ethanol fermentation ability with the wild type. And uh, we uh, analyzed uh, inact pressure inactivation behaviors of uh, this mutant compared with the wild type from 175 megapascal to 25 megapascals. And uh, surprisingly, uh, pressure inactivation behavior followed the fast order kinetics. So the Logarithmic survival ratio showed, and uh, sorry, uh, logarithmic survival ratios and the uh, pressuring time are uh, like this uh, linear correlationships. And uh, 
the k values is uh, inactivation rate con constant. So larger k values shows uh, quickly inactivated. Uh, for example, 200 to 50 megapascal. Wild type uh, in the wild type uh, go like this, but uh, mutant uh, like this. The uh, viability loss of the mutant were uh, remarkably c compared with the uh, wild type. And uh, the K values of strains, uh, K31 uh, wild type and the mutant were measured and the, the combination between 150 megapascal to 250 megapascal combined with uh, zero to, to 40 degrees. This is the results and uh, the, uh, the vertical axis is uh, logarithmic uh, K inactivation rate constant, so larger K value shows uh, quickly uh, inactivated. So all, combi all combination of uh, temperature and pressure, temperature and pressure, the mutant uh, quickly uh, inactivated. And interestingly, uh, for both strains, uh, the uh, uh, inactivation uh, rate is uh, minimum at uh, uh, 10 degrees and uh, 150 uh, megapascals. And uh, the both strains uh, increase inactivation rate. Mm to when you apply the higher pressure and uh, higher temperature and uh, lower temperature. This is uh, quite uh, <laughs> interesting for me. So uh, we wanted to, uh, the mechanism of uh, how the mutant uh, are, uh, is easily inactivated under uh, high pressure as well as high temperature and uh, lower temperatures. And uh, the first hint was, uh, first clue was uh, obtained a student stained the mitochondria of these two strains using mitotraca red uh, when the mitochondrial function was uh, uh, sorry mitochondria is a function funct mm, uh, the you can see the uh, this is mitotraca red can stain the cells uh, in a red colored as a white type you can see red colored cells, but uh, the mutant shows no red colors. That is, uh, uh, that, that suggests uh, PS, this uh, piezo sensitive mutant showed this function in mitochondria. And the next, we detect several some genes located in the mitochondrial DNA by PCR method. And uh, this is the result. And you can see COX3, COB, these genes are detected in both strains, but uh, only COX1 gene uh, uh, parent uh, wild type strain we uh, you can see detect, but uh, the mutant you cannot see detect. So uh, COX1 gene, this gene was deleted in the mutant, 
And uh, this gene encodes uh, the subunit one of cytochrome C oxidase. So the dysfunction of uh, respiratory chain in mitochondria would correlate to piezo sensitivity. And uh, the next question is um, how the mitochondrial dysfunction, maybe uh, respiratory chain reaction dysfunction is correlated to uh, pressure and temperature sensitivity. Uh, we carried out the uh, analysis on metabolites concerning energy metabolism of uh, the mutant. And uh, we uh, cultivate the wild type and the mutant in uh, YPD medium uh, up to 60 hours. And uh, after six hours, 12 hours, 20 hours, and 40 hours, uh, the cells were harvested and the metabolites of uh, glycolysis pathway and the TCA cycle pathway were analyzed. This is the result of uh, metabolites of glycolysis pathway during cultivation. Uh, blue color are the wild type and the red color are for mutants. Uh, for both strains, glucose accumulated to zero to 12 hours cultivation and then consumed. These four metabolites uh, concerning the glycolysis pathways uh, were also accumulated from six to 12 hours cultivation and then consumed. No apparent difference between the wild type strain and the mutant, the mutant in uh, metabolites of glycolysis pathway were detected. In constant, uh, so, uh, deletion of COX-1 gene appeared to no effect on the flux in glycolysis pathway. But uh, in contrast, uh, next we analyze metabolites of, uh, met metabolites of TCA cycle during cultivation. For, uh, th this is a map of TCA cycle and uh, for the site rate and the marriage uh, we can we cannot see the different of uh, uh, metabolites in uh, these two strains. No apparent difference between the two strains for these two metabolites. But the uh, succinate here and the two oxytocrutarate here. You can see for wider type strains, uh, these two metabolites accumulate in the cells from six to 12 hours cultivation and then consumed here, like here. But in the mutant, uh, the accumulation speed is delayed and uh, six to 12, 24 hours and then consumed. The flux delayed in the mutant. And uh, surprisingly, these, these four uh, metabolites were hardly detected in the mutant strain. So deletion of COX-1 gene appeared to restrict the flux in TCA cycle was uh, observed. From these results, uh, the flux in glycolysis pathway in uh, mutant appeared to be compar comparable with that in uh, wild type. But 
mutant showed restricted flux in the TCA cycle compared with the wild type. And this is the cell of yeast, and the glycolysis pathway is located in the cytosol, and the ethanol fermentation goes well, so uh, no effect in the, this area and this pathway, but uh, uh, COX-1 deletion deficient the uh, respiratory chain located on the mitochondria and uh, maybe limited energy generation and uh, limited amino acid synthesis uh, was caused by the restriction in the TCA cycle. This uh, function, uh, this function uh, caused the piezo sensitivity. And uh, by the analysis, uh, this function of mitochondrial function cause the piezo sensitivity of the yeast cell, we can generate piezo sensitive sake yeast strain, uh, piezo sensitivity of sake yeast strains. Uh, using this K, K7, strain K7 is a very, very popular strain for sake making in Japan. And uh, we use the mutant Piezo sensitive mutant A924E1, uh, in which mitochondrial COX1 gene is uh, deleted. And uh, as a uh, piezo sensitive donor of mitochondria. And after making, mating, uh, selection of the diploid strain having COX1, COX1 gene deleted mitochondria. And uh, Sorry, and uh, the we obtained two strain KE zero three and forty five, and applied for two hundred megapascal high pressure treatment for uh, one minute. Uh, here, two hundred twenty five megapascal for six. Uh, sorry, uh, one minute. And you can see the strain K7 shows uh, no uh, decrease in the viable cell count even after uh, high pressure treatment. Yes, but uh, uh, new regenerated uh, uh, mutants have having uh, mitochondria with uh, COX1 deletion um, after pressure treatment, the viability goes down, degrees, degrees, degrees. So uh, now we can easily uh, generate piezo-sensitive strains, sake yeast strains by uh, introduced, uh, introduction of uh, COX-1 deleted mitochondria. This is my conclusion. Uh, restricted flux in TCA cycle in the second missus cell VCA piezo sensitive mutant was demonstrated using metabolomix approach. And the deletion of COX-1 gene would lead to limited energy generation and other TCA cycle originated metabolism such as uh, amino acid synthesis resulting in the stress sensitivity. The results allowed us to generate piezo sensitive mutant, mutants easily using the mitochondrial dysfunction as a marker. Generation of piezo sensitive mutants from practical yeast strains uh, such as strain K7 for sake brewing is uh, presently undergoing. Okay. And uh, I have uh, another 10 minutes. So uh, I want to introduce other studies on uh, high hydrostatic pressure application on foods. The first 
topic is uh, uh, super fine rice flour by high pressure technologies. Um, the conclusion is the high pressure technology provided fine particle size rice flour but low starch damages. And uh, um, a large production of rice in the Niigata prefecture, so uh, uh, production, uh, production technology for uh, rice powder, rice flour is also activated. And uh, um, enzyme pectinase treatment and the subsequent wet uh, milling, milling method can um, provide uh, a fine rice flour, which can be used for uh, rice uh, bread making. And uh, we, we found that uh, the pectinase Enzyme activity is uh, increased under high pressure about uh, 200 megapascals. So with this enzyme treatment uh, combined with uh, high pressure processing. And uh, finally, uh, this, this is the uh, conventional rice powder, uh, the particle size about uh, 100 mega, uh, micrometers, and uh, enzyme treatment, after en enzyme treatment, we can uh, obtain uh, fine rice flour at the particle size of 50, about 50 micrometers, but um, enzyme treatment with high, high pressure treatment, we can obtain here uh, mean particle size of 20 micrometers. But uh, uh, the starch damage is uh, very low. So uh, the product is suitable for uh, producted uh, rice flour, uh, we call super fine rice flour, is suitable for manufacturing bread, cakes, and the noodles with smooth and the moist textures. This is uh, um, uh, for uh, example for pressure uh, processing for food technologies. And uh, other uh, result is here. Um, high hazards static pressure and the subsequent preservation on the antioxidant activities of agricultural pro products. Uh, surprisingly, uh, high pressure treatment can uh, enhance the um, antioxidative activity of agro products. And uh, this is the uh, example of parsley. Um, the major polyphenic, polyphenolic compounds in parsley is uh, this maronyl apine. And after uh, high pressure processing, uh, the amount of uh, maronyl apine decrease and the uh, uh, amount of apine increase compared with the uh, until it did the control, you can see the large peak of uh, being detected. So, um, apine per maronyl apine ratio increased by high pressure treatment with the highest value of about 400 megapascals. So, uh, convention of uh, maronyl apine to apine was promoted by HP treatment. And uh, as a result, the antioxidative activity also increased in the parsley by pressure. The last uh, example is uh, sacrific sacrification of a starch 
of a tuberous root of a sweet potato. As you know, uh, sweet potato is not so sweet uh, before uh, heating. And uh, when you um, heat the sweet potato, the starch is uh, gen gelatinized and uh, uh, emirases uh, enzyme degrade uh, starch still active and the uh, potato changed to a lovely sweet taste. And uh, high pressure also uh, gelatinize, uh, can gelatinize the starch and the uh, amylase still active, so we uh, analyze the effect of high pressure on sacrification of starch of uh, sweet potato. As a result, uh, five megapascals uh, high pressure up to 70 degrees for 10 minutes. Uh, pressure gelatinized were functioned and the amylase is still active and the high amount of reducing sugars were obtained. And as a result, um, high pressure assisted in situ process for gelatinization and the sacrification of starch and tuberous root of sweet potato was uh, proposed. Yeah, this is the final slide. Yeah, um, microorganisms have maintained uh, the Earth environment for 3.5 billion years, and the uh, deep sea with the uh, high pressure might, and I prefer to should provide an uh, environmental factor for the birth of life. So I um, communicate with my student every day. A research on the microorganisms and the high pressure with uh, our younger scientists would uh, provide an innovation in microbiology, food science, and bioscience. Thank you for mu so much for your kind attention. If, if there are no, no questions in the last presentation, uh, on behalf of the College of Agricultural Innovation, Biotechnology and Food, so we hope that uh, you will receive all the, well, the most valuable uh, knowledge and uh, experience from our three uh, distinguished uh, speakers today. So the college, uh, of agricultural innovation, biotechnology, and food of Rangsit University is built up to make all of this area in terms of integration uh, from the upstream, middle stream, and downstream together. As the Dr. Turu has men been mentioned, that we start originally, uh, we like to, to study on how we're going to make food, but from how to make food, where uh, 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 the raw material com, com, came from. So we tried to, to make this uh, integration together in trying to, to study and then give the student to a chance to, to know how to plant crops, uh, livestock, uh, where, where it's from, and then how to process in terms of cultivation or raising on this livestock and go to the uh, food technology. So that's why the formulation of the college is trying to integrate it, all of this knowledge together so the student can learn uh, from the beginning to the end of the productions for the human consumption. So uh, today we're receiving the knowledge from these three uh, distinguished uh, uh, speakers who are experience on what 
each of them uh, uh, do, uh, carry on the research in Japan, in Korea. So I hope that uh, our Thai people or our students will learn uh, from this. But in the future, we will be more in terms of this uh, academic collaboration uh, among our university, Rangsit and uh, Hankook or the Niigata University or Zukuba University in the future. So I hope that uh, today we learn a lot from these three uh, distinguished uh, speakers. So uh, before we have lunch, I would like to ask uh, our dean and uh, Dr. Yubokanit to give the brief and short uh, uh, conclusion in each of the topics, and the student can uh, get on this uh, conclusion for their own uh, uh, consideration for study and, and also for the knowledge, and to prepare themselves to what we have learned from uh, our speaker today. So I will start from Dr. Banjad, uh, Dr. Hazarat, and doc Dr. Yubokanit to, to give us the brief, and then before we uh, at, uh, finish our conference today. So please. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I will conclude in Thai, eh? <laughs> <laughs> not in English, eh? for our students and our uh, audience, OK? <laughs> ก็ดรโทเฟลครับแล้วก็ได้พูดถึงเรื่องเครื่องจักรการเกษตรในสมัยใหม่นะครับเพราะว่าแนวโน้มในโลกนี้ที่จะเกิดขึ้นคือแรงงานจะหายไปนะฮะจะขาดแคลนเพราะฉะนั้นเพราะฉะนั้นเครื่องจักรกลที่จะช่วยผ่อนแรงของเราในการทำงานเกษตรนะฮะท่านพูดถึงตั้งแต่เริ่มต้นนะครับท่านมองให้เรามองเห็นภาพว่าอนาคตเนี่ยมันจะไปยังไงนะครับเ,เครื่องจักรกลทั้งหลายหรือ AI หรืออินเทอร์เน็ตออฟติ้งทั้งหลายจะเข้ามาละนะครับนะฮะจะทำงานโดยอัตโนมัตินะครับตอนนี้อยู่ในช่วงที่กำลังเปลี่ยนผ่านเปลี่ยนผ่านนะฮะจากจากจากจากแมนนวลนะครับจากเ,เครื่องจักรกลปกติใช้คนขับนะครับก็จะไปเป็นอัตโนมัติมากขึ้นนะครับโดยเริ่มตั้งแต่การเตรียมดินซึ่งการเกษตรเราเนี่ยนะครับเบสิกคือการเตรียมดินที่ดีนะฮะคนเคยไถนาคนเคยขุดดินจะรู้ว่ามันเหนื่อยยากนะครับอาจารย์โทฟเอลได้แสดงเห็นแล้วว่าตอนนี้สบายมากนะฮะแท็กเตอร์นะฮะลากเครื่องไถทํางานเองนะฮะบังคับด้วยตัวเองนะครับเริ่มแต่เตรียมดินนะฮะแล้วก็มีเครื่องมือต่างสแสดงให้เห็นถัดมาก็เป็นการปลูกนะฮะการปลูกนะฮะปลูกในสภาพดินที่มีความชื้นมากหรือเปียกแฉะหรือในสภาพดินแห้งนะครับเครื่องมือเครื่องจักรกลทั้งหลายเข้ามาแทนที่ละนะครับอีกหน่อยแล้วก็แล้วก็จะเมื่อแทนที่การทำงานของคนจะเกิดความแม่นยำขึ้นที่เราจะเรียกว่า precision agriculture ที่เราคุ้นเคยกันมานะครับถัดจากการปลูกแล้วจะมีการดูแลก็ดูแลรักษาก็คืออย่างเช่นการพ่นยาฆ่า,มาแมลงนะฮะจะไม่ใช้คนละนะครับเครื่องพ่นยาที่ที่ที่ที่พ่นเข้าไปที่ต้นพืชนะฮะจะ precision มากขึ้นคือกระทั่งแม่นยำประเภทที่ว่าตรงไหนนะฮะจะพ่นมากหรือพ่นน้อยหรือมีศัตรูพืชมากศัตรูพืชน้อยเนี่ยมันสามารถาพ่นได้ให้ถูกต้องถูกกับจำนวนที่ต้องการฆ่า,มาแมลงได้อะไรอย่างนี้เป็นต้นนะครับซึ่งนี่คือเป็นความก้าวหน้าทางวิชาการซึ่งซึ่งกำลังก้าวหน้าต่อไปนะครับถัดมาก็จะเป็นเรื่องการเก็บเกี่ยวนะครับเห็นเครื่องเก็บเกี่ยวเครื่องเกี่ยวนวดข้าวคอมบายใหญ่ๆใช่ไหมเราเห็นบ้านเราวิ่งวิ่งอยู่แถวในไรนานะฮะซึ่งใช้คนขับขนาดใหญ่มากนะฮะอาจารย์เห็นอาจารย์โชว์เห็นว่าอนาคตนะฮะเครื่องเกี่ยวนวดพวกนี้นะฮะเกี่ยวนวดข้าวนะฮะพวกนี
จะทำงานโดยอัตโนมัติมี GPS control นะครับสามารถวิ่งได้ตรงนะฮะนะฮะประหยัดเวลานะฮะในการทำงานแม่นยำนะครับอาจารย์ได้แสดงให้เห็นนะฮะที่น่าสนใจมากคือแท็กเตอร์คันหนึ่งเนี่ยก่อนที่จะไปใช้งานเนี่ยนะฮะเราต้องขับแท็กเตอร์ใช่ไหมฮะถอยหลังไปติดเครื่องมือนะฮะแล้วก็ขับไปทำงานมีแท็กเตอร์อยู่คันหนึ่งผมผมชอบใจมากเลยทำงานเองนะครับมันถอยหลังเข้าไปติดเครื่องมือนะฮะจะเป็นไถหรือจะเป็นเครื่องพ่นยามันเข้าไปต่อเองนะฮะแล้วก็เคลื่อนที่ออกไปเองเห็นไหมครับก้าวหน้ามากนะครับอนาคตพวกเราคงคงจะเป็นอย่างนี้ฮะหนีไม่พ้นนะครับเพราะฉะนั้นเตรียมตัวรับเทคโนโลยีเหล่านี้นะครับถ้าเราพร้อมนะฮะถ้านวัตกรรมเกษตรเราพร้อมนะฮะเราก็จะอะไรฮะไปทํางานที่ไหนก็ได้ในโลกนี้นะครับอันนี้ฝากเอาไว้กับพวกเราขอบพระคุณครับสำหรับหัวข้อที่ท่านดรโซคูได้กล่าวถึงนะคะในเรื่องของ genetic factor involved in regional adaptation of rice นะคะท่านก็จะพูดถึงว่าพันธุกรรมของข้าวนะคะที่มีผลต่อการปรับตัวในสภาพสภาวะโลกร้อนนะคะก่อนอื่นจะขอพูดถึงแบ็กกราวแบ็กกราวของข้าวให้ฟังนิดหน่อยคือข้าวเนี่ยในในโลกเนี่ยมีอยู่3ชนิดคือข้าวจาปนิก้าคือพวกเมล็ดสั้นๆที่เรานิ่มๆเอาไมาโรสต่ำเนี่ยเราทานแล้วอร่อยที่เราส่วนใหญ่ปลูกในพวกเทมเปอร์ในในแถบหนาวนะคะแล้วก็บ้านเราเป็นข้าวอินดิก้าเม็ดยาวนะคะจริงๆแล้วมันมีอีกข้าวอีกอย่างคือจาปนิก้าเอ้ยจาปนิก้าซึ่งจริงๆแล้วไม่ค่อยได้มีปลูกกันนะปรากฏว่าจริงๆแล้วข้าวเนี่ยมีพันธุกรรมส่วนใหญ่เป็นช็อตเดย์แพลนคือตอบสนองเป็นโฟโตเพลียเซนซิทีฟคือตอบสนองต่อช่วงแสงเมื่อได้รับวันสั้นปั๊บก็จะออกดอกเป็นข้าวที่เป็นข้าวพันธุ์พื้นเมืองส่วนใหญ่ซึ่งข้าวญี่ปุ่นข้าวทานอร่อยส่วนใหญ่ยกเว้นข้าวที่ได้รับการปรับปรุงแล้วคือไม่ตอบสนองที่บ้านเราเขาเรียกว่าไม่ตอบสนองต่อช่วงแสงบ้านเราเรียกว่าข้าวนาปลังนะคะประเด็นตรงนี้คือว่าการที่ข้าวนี่นะคะที่บอกว่าเป็นช็อตเดย์แพลนเนี่ยการที่ข้าวจะเปลี่ยนจากเวเจตทีฟสเตสเตทนะคะคือจากจากเอ่อที่เป็นเป็นเป็นรีโพรดักทีฟสเตทเนี่ยจะมีปัจจัย2ปัจจัยคือช่วงแสงคือโฟโตเพลียเซนซีฟกับอุณหภูมินะคะทีนี้เมื่อมี2ปัจจัยนี้ในสภาวะประเด็นที่เขาศึกษาตรงนี้มาเข้าประเด็นนะคะเขาศึกษาคือเขาจูหัวว่าว่าทำไม regional adaptive เนี่ยสำคัญในพืชจริงๆแล้วเป็นเพราะว่าการความนิยมของการรับประทานข้าวจาปนิก้าเนี่ยเพิ่มขึ้นตอนนี้นะคะแล้วก็เมื่อเอาพอเพิ่มขึ้นถ้าเราเอาจาปนิก้าเนี่ยซึ่งมันปลูกเขาบอกหายและติจูดก็คือปลูกใน temperate zone เนี่ยเพราะว่าถ้าแบบประเภทบ้านเราเนี่ยคืออยู่ในใกล้เส้นอีควาเตอร์คือศูนย์เนี่ยก็คือโลเลติจูดเนี่ยอยู่ใกล้ใกล้เทมอยู่ในใกล้ใกล้เส้นสูงศูนย์เนี่ยมันก็จะอยู่ในสภาพอากาศร้อนแต่ถ้าเอาข้าวที่ปลูกในอากาศเย็น,นมาปลูกเนี่ยมันก็จะตอบสนองต่อช่วงแสงเกิดว่าออกดอกเร็วข้าวเนี่ยถ้าเอาจาปนิก้ามาปลูกบ้านเราเนี่ยเดือนกว่าๆก็ออกดอกแล้วแถมออกดอกนี่นะคะเฮดดิ้งเนี่ยมันไม่ได้เฮดดิ้งทุกแผ่นอีกมันไม่ได้เฮดออกดอกทุกๆก,กอมันก็ออกไปเรื่อยๆนะเกี่ยวก็ย่างไม่บลูมพร้อมกันฉะนั้นเขาก็ต้องการที่จะปรับปรุงเรื่องนี้เขายกตัวอย่างนะคะอีกอันหนึ่งที่สําคัญคือคนนิยมกินจาปนิก้าเยอะขึ้นต่อไปเนี่ยถ้าโลกร้อนขึ้นมันมีสไลด์อันนึงที่บอกว่าแอปเปิลในในในเกาหลีพื้นที่ถ้าโลกร้อนขึ้นหนึ่งองศาจะปลูกพื้นที่จะลดลงไปเรื่อยๆข้าวโคกเกรงว่าถ้าโลกร้อนขึ้นโอกาสที่จะปลูกข้าวเนี่ยพื้นที่ปลูกก็จะลดลงฉะนั้นเขาก็เลยพยายามศึกษาเรื่องนี้หายีนที่เกี่ยวข้องยีนที่เกี่ยวข้องเนี่ยมันก็ไม่ใช่ยีนตัวเดียวเขาก็ต้องศึกษามันมีศัพท์คําว่า QTL เข้ามาเขาก็ศึกษา quantitative t r a d e loss เพราะยีนมีในในข้าวเนี่ยมีหลายๆตัวซึ่ง interact มีปฏิสัมพันธ์กันในเรื่องของการออกดอกการ heading ของข้าวนะคะซึ่งบางยีนเนี่ยพอมันร้อนอาจจะไม่ฟังก์ชันหรือบางยีนมันก็โปรโมทกันอยู่2ตัวแล้วมันจะช่วยกันบางยีนมันก็ซับเพลสกันคือมันกดไม่ให้ยีนอีกตัวทํางานยีนที่เกี่ยวข้องกับการออกดอกเนี่ยของข้าวตอนนี้ที่เขาศึกษาแล้วมีประมาณตั้ง17ยีนเขาถึง
ถึงยีนนะคะแต่ว่าจะบอกถึงว่าความสําคัญของการการศึกษายีนเหล่านี้เขาจะพยายามศึกษาว่ายีนอะไรเกี่ยวข้องบ้างแล้วเขาจะมานํานํามาใช้ในการปรับปรุงพันธุ์ข้าวซึ่งให้สามารถที่จะในข้าวที่ปลูกในเทมเพลตโซนมาปลูกในข้าวที่เป็นใกล้ๆท็อปิคอลโซนได้ซึ่งไม่ให้ผลผลิตมันต่ําลงจริงๆแล้วเขาคัดเลือกได้แล้วเขารู้ยีนไหลตัวแล้วแต่ว่าประเด็นมันก็คือว่าเมื่อมาปลูกแล้วนอกจากมันข้าวอาจจะปรับตัวได้แต่ว่าก็อ่อนแอต่อสภาพแวดล้อมหลายๆอย่างในโดยเฉพาะพวกไบโอติกสเตรสเช่นทนอุณหภูมิทนร้อนทนแล้งพวกอะไรอย่างเงี้ยทนน้ำท่วมอะไรอย่างเงี้ยเขาก็ต้องการคอมบายพวกนี้เข้าด้วยกันคือยีนเรื่องอการออกดอกที่ให้แมนออกดอกแล้วก็ยีนพวกทนอับไอโอติกสเตรสนะคะเขาก็ใช้หลายๆเทคนิคซึ่งเขาพูดลงไปลึกเลยทั้งนี้เราก็ทราบว่าไม่ใช่นักศึกษาทุกคนที่จะอยู่ในสายไบโอเทคนะคะก็เลยจะพูดคร่าวๆนะคะก็ประมาณแค่นี้นะคะถ้าเกิดว่าเขาไอดีนิฟายยีนได้ทุกตัวแล้วเขาคอมบายยีนยีนที่การออกดอกแล้วก็อับไบโอติกสเตรสสาเร็จก็สามารถที่จะนําข้าวที่ปลูกเป็นข้าวจัปโปนิก้าเนี่ยปลูกในใน,ในเขตบ้านเราได้ปัจจุบันเขานําไปทดเอานําข้าวของเขาเนี่ยไปทดสอบในประเทศฟิลิปปินส์อยู่เพื่อคัดเลือกหาแคนดิเดตยีนที่สามารถจะทําได้แต่ก็เออต้นพันข้าวที่เป็นแคนดิเดตยีนที่ปลูกได้นะคะก็เขาคิดว่าเขาจะมีการทดลองแล้วเขาคอมบายยีนสองสองกลุ่มนี้แล้วเขาก็มีการเออจะไปทดสอบที่ฟิลิปปินส์แล้วก็จะอินโดด้วยแต่เขาอาจจะมีปัญหาที่อินโดเขาอาจจะเปลี่ยนมาทดสอบที่บ้านเราก็ได้นะคะค่ะข้อข้อนี้ขอบคุณค่ะเด็กๆสบายเลยเนะเพราะครูให้ทำคอนคลูชันส่งครูทั้งสามท่านโอเคของครูได้รับมอบหมายให้สรุปของโปรเฟสเซอร์ดรชิเกมัสึโทรุอาจารย์พูดถึงเรื่องของ a new brewing process ในการทำ Japanese rice rice wine หรือ sake นั่นเองด้วยวิธีใหม่ก็คือการทำ high hydrostatic pressure หรือ HP วิธีนี้เนี่ยมันจะคล้ายๆกับการทำเหมือนกับโคเป็นโคพาสเจอไรเซชันนั่นไม่ได้หมายความว่าเมื่อผ่านกระบวนการนี้จุลินทรีย์จะหายไปเหมือนกับโคสเตอร์ไรเซชันที่เราเรียกว่าการฉายรังสีไม่ใช่มันยังคงมีอาจารย์พูดถึงสไลด์บางบางสไลด์ที่จะมองเห็นว่ามันจะมีแบคทีเรียบางชนิดที่เป็นสปอร์ฟอร์มี่ยังคงอยู่ทีนี้อาจารย์ก็รีวิวตั้งแต่เรื่องของการทำสาเกในญี่ปุ่นก็คือตั้งแต่รีวิวสาเกมานะฮะว่ากระบวนการทำสาเกเนี่ยในนิกาตาเนี่ยผลิตมาประมาณ 10% ของสาเกที่ผลิตในเจแปนแล้วก็ตัวสาเกดังๆก็มีชื่ออยู่ที่นี่ผลิตที่นี่หมดนะฮะกระบวนการก็เริ่มตั้งแต่เอาเอา,เอา,เ,อาเชื้อเอาสตีมไรซ์มาผสมกับโคจิโมใช่ไหมฮะแล้วก็ใส่ยีสต์มิกซ์เข้าไปก็เกิดแซคคริฟิเคชันไอแซคคริฟิเคชันนี่คือการเปลี่ยนแปลงให้เป็นกรูโคสหลังจากนั้นก็เข้าสู่กระบวนการเฟอร์เมนต์ตรงนี้ก็เรียกเฟอร์เมนต์แล้วแล้วก็มีการเปลี่ยนกรูโคสให้เป็นเอทานอลโดยยีสต์หลังจากนั้นจะมีการสต็อกเฟอร์เมนเทชันเพื่อป้องกันโอเวอร์เฟอร์เมนเทชันโดยไมโครแกนิซึมจากพวกโดยวิธี thermal sterilization เพื่อให้เกิด better shelf life ก็คือให้ยืดอายุการเก็บให้ยาวนานแต่ทีนี้มันมีผลมันจะไปมีผลต่อ original taste นะแล้วก็มีผลต่อ flavor ที่มันจะ wheel change ไปได้นะเพราะฉะนั้นวิธีนั้นอาจจะไม่เหมาะแล้วนะอาจารย์ก็มีวิธีใหม่ที่มานำเหนอเราก็คือว่าเราจะเปลี่ยนมาโดยใช้ high pressure นั่นแหละอาจารย์ก็พูดถึงมันเหมือนกับเอาอาหารเนี่ยทิ้งลงไปในใต้ใต้ทะเลที่ลึกมากๆอ่ะมันก็จะเกิดความดันประมาณนี้นะคะเพราะฉะนั้นตรงนี้ก็เป็นเรื่องใหม่สําหรับสําหรับพวกเราก็คืออย่างเช่นอาจารย์พูดถึงเมกะปาสอะไรก็คือเมกะปาสคานนั่นเองหลักประมาณตั้งแต่200ปาสคานขึ้นไปเนี่ยมันจะไป inactivate แล้วก็ไปยับยั้งการกรอทของจุลินทรีย์ได้เพราะฉะนั้นตรงนี้ก็เลยช่วยทําให้การการเจริญเติบโตของจุลินทรีย์ที่ทําให้เกิดการสปอยของอาหารเนี่ยหายไปเลยโดยเฉพาะในสาเกเพราะฉะนั้นเฟลเวอร์ทั้งหลายหรือรสชาติด้วยนะคะมันก็ยังคงอยู่ไม่มีการเปลี่ยนแปลงใดๆดีกว่าการใช้วิธีดั้งเดิมทีนี้ตัวอย่างของอสาเกตที่อาจารย์พูดถึงก็ครูก็ไม่เคยกินนะนะแบบแล้วก็มีการเอามาใช้กับไวท์ไทไวท์ไทที่เราใช้ในการผลิตสาเกตกับตัวไอมิวแตนที่เป็นมีชื่อว่า p s s o s e n s i
ของการสลายหรือการสร้างด้วยปรากฏว่าไอ้ตัวไกโคลิซิสพาดเวเนี่ยไม่แตะต้องมันไปแตะต้องตรงช่วง TCA cycle ตัวที่เข้าไปแตะก็คือ COX1 yin COX1 yin จะ delete deletion ของ COX1 yin ไปซึ่งตรงนี้มันก็จะมีผลต่อการ f l u c in ของไอ้ไอ้กระบวนการทางด้าน energy synthesis กับ amino synthesis แต่ไม่มีผลต่อน้ำตาลที่จะเปลี่ยนเป็นแอลกอฮอล์ถูกไหมฮะมันมาจากไกโคลิซิสผ่านเวฟเพราะได้ไพลูวิกแล้วมันจะเปลี่ยนเป็นน้ำตาลแอทเทนอลนี้มันเกิดขึ้นปกติเพราะฉะนั้นวิธีนี้ไม่มีผลต่อต่อต่อผ่านเวฟตอนตอนที่เริ่มต้นแต่มีผลตอนหลังอันนี้ก็เป็นเรื่องดีทําให้เรารู้รู้เชิงลึกประมาณนี้และนอกจากนี้เนี่ยกระบวนการใช้ HSP ยังมีประโยชน์ในเรื่องอื่นๆอย่างเช่นเรื่องของอสารชีวโมเลกุลตัวอื่นนะจ๊ะบอกว่ามันเกิดไบโอไบโอคอนเวอร์ชันของพวกฟีโนลิกโพลิฟีโนลิกคอมเพลตได้นะฮะมันเปลี่ยนโครงสร้างของสารทําให้เราได้สารตัวใหม่ที่มีเขาเรียกหาสารสารคุณสมบัติที่ดีดีกว่าเดิมในต่อสุขภาพร่างกายหรืออะไรอย่างนี้ในในทางอุตสาหกรรมจะเอาไปใช้ประโยชน์ได้เลยนะฮะหรืออีกอันนึงก็คือเอฟเฟกของแซคลิฟิเคชันออนออนสตาร์ชของไอตัวมันมันมันหวานอาจารย์บอกว่ามันมีผล <coughs> ในการทำเจลาตินไนซ์แล้วก็ซัคลิฟิเคชันของสวีทโปเตโต้ด้วยนะคะเพราะฉะนั้นอะมิเลสก็ยังคงสติลแอคทีฟเพราะฉะนั้นเราจะเห็นว่าการนำไปใช้ประโยชน์มีมากมายหลากหลายมากๆเลยก็เป็นอะไรที่น่าสนใจและตื่นเต้นมากนะคะเราอาจจะได้ใช้แต่อาจารย์ก็ยังบอกว่าเครื่องมือมันยังมีราคาแพงอยู่เพราะฉะนั้นตรงนี้ก็ก็ค่อยๆไต่ไปนะว่าเราจะทาอะไรได้มากน้อยแค่ไหนโอเคมีคาถามไหมเอ่ยไม่มีนะคะเสร็จเลยสรุปให้เสร็จนะคะขอบคุณมากก่อนอื่นก็จะมีท็อกอินไทยขอขอบคุณท่านท่านอาจารย์ทั้งสามท่านนะท่านชมดีนะครับที่ช่วยสรุปเพราะว่าเราต้องการจะคอนเฟิร์มกับนักศึกษานะครับสําหรับท่านแขกท่านอาจารย์ที่จากมหาวิทยาลัยอื่นจากสถาบันอื่นนะครับก็คงจะได้รับความรู้ได้รับข้อคิดเห็นจากทั้งสามท่านซึ่งเราได้เชิญมาจากญี่ปุ่นสองท่านแล้วก็จากเกาหลีหนึ่งท่านเนี่ยนะครับก็คิดว่ารายการเช่นนี้ก็จะจัดขึ้นเป็นประจำที่นี่นะครับแล้วก็ในเดือนพฤศจิกายนที่ที่กำลังจะถึงข้างหน้านี้เราก็จะมีงานที่นี่เราก็จะมีการประชุมสัมมนาเช่นนี้นะฮะแล้วก็จะเป็นการเชิญวิทยากรมาจากต่างประเทศด้วยนะครับครับก็คิดว่าวันนี้คงเป็นประโยชน์อย่างยิ่งนะครับ so Finally, I, I would like to give my deep and sincere gratitude to our uh, speaker for your contribution and valuable knowledge for us today. And I thought our uh, participants and also a student and our staff learn a lot from what you uh, give us today. So I hope that in the near future we will be more collaboration in the development of this academic uh, on. A sustainable agricultural development uh, in Thailand, in Japan, or in Korea. So, thank you very much for for your kind uh, support this uh, conference. And also, uh, I'd like to thank all of our participants, students, staff for coming to join us. And hope you enjoy our uh, conference. And hope to uh, have. You back again in the near future to come. So thank you very much.